Bullet to Gula, Dakota, Hilly Sets, 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 Hilly
Jackson. Distinguished chief patron, respected patrons, esteemed guests, respected speakers, honorable delegates, faculty members, and dear fellow participants. A very warm welcome to the inauguration program of the International Seminar on Recent Advancement in Geographical Studies, a Multidimensional Outlook. It is with immense pleasure and honor that we gather here today to mark the beginning of this prestigious event organized by the Department of Geography, Rampurhat College, in collaboration with the Internal Quality Assurance Cell, IQAC, of Rampurhat College. At the outset, we would like to express our sincere gratitude to our esteemed Chief Patron, Dr. Ashish Banerjee, Deputy Speaker and President of the Governing Body of Rampurhat College, your vision and commitment to fostering a culture of academic excellence have been an inspiration to all of us. We are truly grateful for your continuous encouragement and for providing us with the necessary resources to make this event a grand success. Thank you, sir. We would also like to extend my heartfelt appreciation to our beloved patrons, Dr. Prabal Kumar Sinha, President of Rampurhat College, and Dr. Buthadev Mukherjee, Coordinator of IQSC Rampurhat College. Your invaluable guidance and support have played a significant role in, sh in shaping this seminar. We would like to take this moment and express our sincere gratitude to our esteemed special guest, Sri R.K. Mina, the Director of NATMO. We are truly honored by your presence here today. We would also like to extend our heartfelt appreciation to the Vice Chancellor of Chidu Kanubirshay University, the Pro Vice Chancellor of the University of Bajwan, the District Magistrate of Rampurhat, of Birhum, sorry, the Subdivision Officer of Rampurhat, the Registrar of the University of Bajwan, and the Chairman of Rampurhat Municipality. Your esteemed presence and support further inspire us to continue our pursuit of knowledge and innovation.
sincere gratitude to our sponsor, the Science and Engineering Research Board, Indian Council of Social Science Research, Indian Council of Social Science Research Eastern Regional Center, National Bank for Agriculture and Rural Development, Survey of India, Anthropological Survey of India, National Atlas and Thematic Mapping Organization, Indian Society of Remote Sensing, Department of Science and Technology and Biotechnology, Rampurhat Municipality, and Advances in Geographical Research for their invaluable support and collaboration. We are confident that our collaboration will foster innovation, knowledge sharing, and advancements in the field of geography. We wish you all a memorable and enriching experience during this international seminar on recent advancement in geographical studies, a multidimensional outlook. May this event foster new connections, inspire innovative research, and contribute to the progress of geographical studies. Thank you, and let us begin this journey of exploration and learning together. It's our honor to introduce the esteemed individuals who have graciously taken on the role of patrons for this international seminar on recent advancement in geographical studies, a multidimensional outlook. Their unwavering support and guidance have been instrumental in making this event a reality. Please join us in acknowledging their presence. First and foremost, we would like to invite our chief patron, Dr. Ashish Banerjee, the president of the governing body of Rampurhat College. Dr. Banerjee's dedication to education has played a crucial role in shaping the college's success. We are grateful for this patronage and continuous support. Next, we would like to invite Dr. Prabal Kumar Shinha, Principal of Rampurhat College, to join us on stage. Dr. Shinha's commitment to academic excellence and his unwavering support for scholarly pursuits have made him an invaluable member of our seminar. We are privileged to have him as a patron. Now, please welcome Dr. Buddhadev Mukherjee, the IQSC coordinator and associate professor in the Department of Philosophy, sorry, in the Department of History at uh, Rampurhat College. Dr. Mukherjee's dedication to quality enhancement in higher education and his expertise. <laughs> Okay, we can wait for five minutes. Yeah? Next, uh, we would like to invite our honorable guest, Sri R. K. Meena, the director of NACMO on the dais. We are truly honored by your presence here today. Next up. Next up, okay. I would like to call on stage uh, Sri Uttam Shadhukha, official delegate from Survey of India. We invite Professor Dhananjay Rakshit, the Vice Chancellor of Shidhu Kanu Bisha University. We are honored to have him among us. We would like to invite Professor Ashish Kumar uh, Panigrahi, Pro Vice Chancellor of the University of Bajwan. We are delighted to have you among us. 
please welcome Shri Bidhan Bhai, the District Magistrate of Bidhan District. We are privileged to have you with us today. Now we invite Shri Sabdal Nawaz, Subdivision Officer at Rampurhat. We are honored to have him join us. Please welcome Dr. Shujit Kumar Chaudhuri, the Registrar of the University of Bajwal. We are honored to have him among us. We invite Shri Shoman Bhagat, the Chairman of Rampurhat Municipality. We are honored to have him among us. All have come? Okay. Okay, now let's uh, give a round of applause to acknowledge their presence and invaluable role they have played in making this seminar a grand success.
As we gather here today to inaugurate the International Seminar on Recent Advancement in Geographical Studies, a multidimensional outlook, it is our distinct honor to invite our esteemed international resource persons to join us on the stage and grace this occasion with their presence and wisdom. Firstly, we invite Professor Jayant K. Rautre, Professor Emeritus of the Asia With his in the field of geography, Professor Rautre has made significant contribution to the discipline The students will now felicitate Professor Rautre. Please let's have a warm round of applause for Professor Rautre. Please welcome Professor Mujibur Rahman, Professor, the Department of Environmental Science, Khulna University, Bangladesh. Professor Rahman's expertise in environmental science and his research in geographical aspects have earned him recognition in the field. We are honored to have him among us. Our students will felicitate Professor Rahman now. Please have a round of applause for Professor Rahman. Now it is our great pleasure to invite the esteemed members of our National Advisory Committee to join us on stage. These eminent individuals have made significant contributions to the field of geography and have dedicated themselves to the pursuit of knowledge and research. Firstly, we invite Dr. Prithvish Nath, the former Surveyor General of India, former dir Director of the National Atlas and Thematic Mapping Organization, Kolkata, and former Vice Chancellor of Mahatma Gandhi, Kashi Vidyapet, Varanasi, India. Hello. Dr. Nath's immense expertise and expertise in geographical studies have shaped the discipline and inspired many researchers in the field. We are honored to have him grace this seminar. Please welcome Professor Shubhi Sharkar from the Department of Geography and Applied Geography, University of North Bengal. Hello. Professor Sharkar's expertise in Applied Geography and his insightful research have greatly enriched the field. We are privileged to have him with us today. Dear students, please assist Sir to take his seat and please felicitate him. Let's have a round of applause for Professor Shorter, please. We invite Dr. Ajit Kumar Shil from Netaji Shubhash Open University, formerly Associate Professor, Department of Geography, Bhairav Ganguly College. Dr. Singh's expertise in geographical studies and his insightful research have greatly enriched the field. We are honored to have him as a part of this seminar.
Next, we would like to invite Professor Devendra Kumar Nayak from the Department of Geography, Northeastern Hill University. Professor Nayak's dedication to teaching and research in the field of geography has earned him immense respect among his peers and students alike. We are privileged to have him with us today. Welcome, sir. Please welcome, sir. Let's have a round of applause for Professor Nayak, please. Students, please. Now we invite Professor Ashish Paul from the Department of Geography, Bidashapur University. Professor Paul's dedication to research and his contribution to geographical studies have earned him recognition in the academic community. We are honored to have him as a part of this seminar. Our students will now felicitate Professor Paul. Let's join them with a round of applause. Now we invite Professor Shunanda Bandopadhyay from the Department of Geography, University of Calcutta. Professor Bandopadhyay's valuable contribution to geographical studies and his commitment to academic excellence make him a highly esteemed member of our advisory committee. Okay, sir is not present today amongst us. Um, okay. Shut. We would like to call on stage uh, Professor Shunil Kumar De from the Department of Geography Northeastern Hill University. Professor Day's extensive knowledge and expertise in geographical studies have made him a well-respected figure in the academic community. We are delighted to have him join us. Now we invite Professor Narayan Chandrajana from the Department of Geography, University of Bajwan. Professor Jana's passion for geography and his invaluable research insights have made a significant impact in the field. We are honored to have him as a part of this seminar. Please give a round of applause for Professor Jana. We invite Professor Ranjan Roy from the Department of Geography and Applied Geography, University of North Bengal. We are honored to have him as part of this seminar. We would like to call on stage Professor A.R. Siddiqui from the Department of Geography, University of Allahabad. Professor Siddiqui's dedication to teaching and research in the field of geography has made him a respected authority. We are delighted to have him among us. Okay, he is not present among us. Now please welcome Professor Sanat Kumar Guchai from the Department of Geography. Okay, he is not present today. Please welcome Professor Elian Satpati, Professor of Geography and Professor Director, UGC, Human Resource Development Center, 
ইউনিভার্সিটি অফ ক্যালকাটা Next, uh, we would like to invite Professor A. K. M. Anwarudhavan from the Department of Geography, Alia University. His vast knowledge and experience in the field of geography have made him a well-respected figure in the academic community. We are honored to have him as part of this seminar. Next, we would like to invite Professor Biplop Bishar from the Department of Geography, University of Badwan. He is not present today. Now, we would like to invite Professor Bisharanjan Mistry from the Department of Geography, University of Badwan. We are delighted to have him as part of this seminar. He is also not present today. Now we would like to call on stage Professor Nilanjana Dash Chatterjee from the Department of Geography, Vidya Shagori University. Professor Chatterjee's expertise in geographical studies and her insightful research have greatly enriched the field. We are honored to have her among us. Now, please welcome Professor Sohil Fidos from the Department of Geography, Sikkim University. Professor Fidos's expertise in geographical studies and his insightful research have greatly enriched the field. We are delighted to have him among us. Next, uh, we would like to call on stage Professor Pradeep Chauhan from the Department of Geography, University of Gorbongo. Professor Chauhan's dedication to research and his contributions to geographical studies have earned him recognition in the academic community. We are privileged to have him with us today. Next, we would like to invite Professor Shoshanko Kumar Gain from the Department of Geography, Coach Bihar Pontanon Borma University. Professor Gain's expertise in geographical studies and his insightful research have greatly enriched the field. We are honored to have him among us. Next, we would like to invite Professor Pial Basu Roy from the Department of Geography. Okay. He is not present? Okay. He is not present today. Next, we would like to invite Dr. Natural Islam from the Department of Geography, Coach Bihar Pontanon Borma University. Dr. Islam's vast knowledge and experience in the field of geography have made him a well-respected figure in the academic community. We are honored to have him as part of this seminar. Now our students will felicitate. Okay, okay, okay. Okay. Now our students will felicitate our esteemed uh, guests on the dais.
Now, uh, we would like to request the organize, organizing secretary of this international seminar, Mr. Ashraful Alam, to join us on the stage. Mr. Ashraful Alam is an assistant professor in the Department of Geography at Rampurhat College. Has been he has been instrumental in coordinating and organizing this remarkable event. His unwavering dedication and meticulous planning have ensured the success of this seminar. Please join us in welcoming Mr. Ashraful Alam on stage with a big round of applause. And finally, we would like to extend a warm invi invitation to our esteemed convener, Dr. Joyanto Dash, to grace the stage. Dr. Das, HOD and Assistant Professor in the Department of Geography at Rampurkat College, has taken on the crucial role of leading and coordinating this international seminar. His extensive knowledge, expertise, and tireless efforts have been instrumental in shaping this event into what it is today. Let us welcome Dr. Joyanto Dash with a resounding round of applause as he joins us on the stage. Atma Deepa Baba, be a light unto yourself. The last words of Buddha to his disciples 
resonant with the encouragement to embrace enlightenment, the source of which can only be found within ourselves. In this journey towards knowledge and enlightenment, we should not veer off the path threatened by sudden pangs of loneliness as we are our own light, our own driving force, our own beacon of hope. This very thought resonates and finds a new life in the walls of Tagore, where he says, if no one answers your call, walk all alone. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Dr. Koen Mukherjee, Department of Geography, Professor Rudar Shankar Dash, Department of Music, and our beloved students on the stage for the inaugural song of the seminar. Let's have a round of applause for our students and for the teachers who are guiding them.
a mellifluous performance even if the poet says even if the poet says if no one answers your call walk all alone we are glad we are thrilled we are amazed having such a wonderful having found such a wonderful response to our call in our guests and our patrons so thanks to all of you for making this program a grand success and dear guest we would like to kindly beg for your um, blessing so that our college our departments we all can move forward and we can enlighten ourselves helped with your blessings thank you so much sirs um, we would like to invite dr umesh kumar and of anthropological survey of india on stage dear students please invite sir please felicitate sir as we embark on this auspicious occasion it is time to symbolically illuminate our path with the lighting of the lamp we request our chief patron our patrons esteemed guests resource persons convener and the organizing secretary to kindly come forward to the stage for the lamp lighting ceremony which will be accompanied by an euphonious chanting by dr koel mukherjee professor uday shankar dash and the students of rampurhat college have you made arrangements for the lighting of the lamp Dear guests kindly grant us a few minutes lighting of the lamp As we honor the ancient Indian tradition of lighting the lamp, signifying the triumph of light over darkness, knowledge over ignorance, and harmony over discord, let us unite in this symbolic act that represents our collective commitment to enlightenment and progress.
following the lamp, li lamp lighting, now we invite all the dignitaries to join us for the watering of the plant. This act symbolizes our dedication to nurturing knowledge, growth, and sustainability in the field of geography and beyond. May this ceremony ignite the spark of inspiration and illuminate our path toward a brighter future. to kindly mark the inauguration of the seminar by launching our abstract volume. Let's have a round of applause, please. the presence of Dr. Prabal Kumar Sinha, Principal of Rampurhat College, to kindly deliver the welcome address. Very good morning to all of you present here. 
it is a moment of extreme pleasure to welcome all of you here for joining with us as principal on behalf of rampurat college i offer my regrets to all of you joining with us today our international seminar on recent advancement in geographical studies a multi dimensional outlook organized by the department of geography and internal quality assessment cell rampurat college it is really a golden moment for us very beginning of the session i extend my gratitude to our honorable president of governing body rampurat college as well as the deputy speaker of west bengal legislative assembly dr ashish banerji for his continuous inspiration around the year for md academic purpose i extend my gratitude to our honorable coordinator internal quality assessment cell rampurat college dr buddhadev mukherji for providing immense supports to make this event i also extend my gratitude to the secretary teachers council dr arindam gangopadhyay for his non stop cooperation for the event i express my gratitude to the honorable vice chancellor skbu sidhu kanu birsa university professor dhananjay rokhet sir thank you for accepting our invitation we have a sweet memories to work together i extend my gratitude to the pro vice chancellor and register of our badwan university i extend my gratitude to the district magistrate birbhum for providing event support to make this event i provided i, I extend my gratitude to the sub divisional officer rampurat for providing event support to make this event i also extend my gratitude to the chairman rampurat municipality for providing even support it is very we are very lucky that we have some financial agencies with us our financial agencies are science and engineering resource board indian council of social science research delhi indian council of social science research eastern region calcutta national bank of agriculture and rural development survey of india anthropological survey of india national atlas and thematic mapping organization indian society of remote sensing department of science and technology and biotechnology government of west bengal our co sponsors are advance in geographical resource rampurat municipality and mr sudip kumar rai our anobani thank you everyone for providing us financial support to organize this event i extend my gratitude to the convener dr joyant das and organizing secretary professor asraful alam to organize such a beautiful seminar and the total faculty member of geography department for this part i convey I, my regards to our a um, colleagues and all our distinguished guests here there are so many distinguished guests are here from the different parts of our country and our state and the abroads thank you everyone sir for accepting our invitation for this seminar i am not want to extend my lecture because we are anxiously waiting for our resource persons presentations here and this is why we are already late ourselves and so i don't want to continue my lecture with these few words i conclude myself here and thank you everyone once again have a good day thank you sir for your kind words now we welcome dr ashish banerji honorable deputy speaker of west bengal legislative assembly and president of the governing body of rampurhat college to kindly deliver the inaugural address over to you sir respected dignitaries principal rampurhat college 
डॉक्टर प्रबल सिन्हा आई क्यू एस सी कन्भेनर प्रफेसर बुद्धदेव मुखार्जी एस डिओ सद्दाम नाभास आई एस रामपुरहाट डेलीगेट्स एंड माई एक्स कलिग एंड भि सी सिधोकानु यूनिवार्सिटी प्रफेसर धनंजय रक्षित एंड अदार डिग्नेटरिज प्रेजेंट हियर आई एम ग्लैड टू बी प्रेजेंट इन टू डेज सेमिनार ऑन द टपिक रिसेंट एडभांसमेंट इन जियोग्राफिकल स्टाडिज ए माल्टी डायमेंशनल आउटलुक माई सिन्सियर ग्रिटिंगस टू अल द पार्टिसिपेंट्स the field of geography as a subject of study has evolved from the from early days of surveying the landscapes mapping the world and exploring new countries and continents to the present day academic discipline with a wide <coughs> scope of topics ranging from highly intricate mathematical models to the social and cultural realm of post modern society in a rapidly changing world the subject is being updated continuously with the advancement in science and technology and especially the revolution in information technology today the subject is focusing on diverse area with dynamic adoption of challenging new technologies in a rapidly transforming world humanity is facing by rates of challenge today we are experiencing the effects of climate change with the hottest and driest months ever on record devastating forest fires devouring the natural forests in different corners of the world building biodiversity diversity and the hazards of anthropogenic changes made in the course of establishing the modern industrial society to face the challenge we must be employing the latest scientific and technological tools and methods and also constant interactions must be there to exchange the most updated findings across the disciplines that is why geography is no exception in its gradual inclination towards a multidimensional approach with the leading institutions worldwide putting increasing importance on interdisciplinary studies the barriers between the divisions with a particular subject is breaking and so also the barriers between differing disciplines for instance science and humanity today we find extensive use of satellite based on geo technologies like gis geography information system and gps global positioning system positioning system remote sensing rs lidar light detection and ranging which allows collecting data on large or in such accessible locations transiting geographical barriers these are used to create 3d models and maps of objects and environments for instance we have recently found how effective these techniques are in monitoring the melting of ice seals in the polar regions melting glaciers and disappearing water bodies the adv advanced computing techniques like cloud computing ai artificial intelligence geo ai one ai and make machine learning or finding its use in analysis of methodological data climate change ground water stress sustainable development ocean or geographic and seasonal molecular studies which are some of the major focus areas today data science and advanced digital technology are being used to find solutions of nutrition security for the ever increasing population of the world by means of sustainable farming preservation of biodiversity and study of human environment interaction with these words 
I am expecting an interesting session of exchange of ideas highlighting the recent advancement of geographical studies in its branches like physical, economic and human geography, biogeography, geomorphology, ocean geography, metrology and hydrology. So to name a few and each presenting exciting opportunities in higher study and pursuing career opportunities to the participants. I earnestly thank the organizers, Jayanto and Asabul, the teachers and students of the college, of the college and all associated with the seminar for presenting this opportunity to the participants. Thank you. Thank you, sir, for sharing with us your observation uh, on the topic. Uh, now we are honored to welcome Dr. Muthodeb Mukherjee, IQSC Coordinator of Rampurhat College, to deliver the special address. Good morning, everybody. Respectable dignitaries and dias, Dr. Ashish Banerjee, ex-student, ex-teacher of the college, and presently uh, president of the governing body and deputy speaker of the West Bengal State Legislative Assembly, uh, respectable SDO subdivisional officer Rampurat, our ex-colleague and presently Vice Chancellor of Sidhu Kanu University, Purulia, Dr. Dhananjoy Rokhit, our principal sir, Dr. Kobal Kumar Sina, and the renowned resource persons from the different parts of India and abroad, different representatives of the different funding agencies, and participants from different university and colleges, students, teachers, and non-teaching staff of the college. Really, I am very happy today. Really, I am happy. After the NAC visit on 14th and 15th March, 2023, I asked all the head of the departments of our college and asked them to organize different types of seminar, national or in international or state level seminar. In response to my call, first of all, the Department of Geography came forward and told me, sir, we want to organize an international seminar. Actually, at that time, I was the teacher in charge of the college. And in, the, uh, in response of my call, the Department of Geography came forward to organize the seminar. And it is nearly five months earlier. And from that time, the faculty of the Department of Geography communicated with the renowned resource person who are actually the authority of the subject. Almost all of them are the authority of the subject of India communicated with them. And they are, they are successful to receive their response their consent and they are successful to make them present in this seminar. I am really happy and I think it is a mega event for a college in a, in a remote location 
and Wapostul area. Really, we have seen many international seminar in colleges and universities. But I think our geography department, faculty of the geography department, Joyanto Asraful and his departmental colleagues made an achievement. Even they have successful to secure financial assistance from different agencies. I am not mentioning their name again because their names have been mentioned by our earlier speakers. Because not, I don't want to linger the lecture. I am thankful, I am grateful to them for stretching their helping hand to a college in this remote area, situated in this remote area. And I am, I always, I am grateful and I thank them all. I thank all of them. I don't want to linger my lecture, but I, I am sure that the next two days will open new horizons of research in this geography and allied disciplines and I am waiting for this and I expect that this seminar will achieve a grand success. Thank you all. This is all. Thank you, sir. We are honored to have Sri Saddam Nawaz, Subdivisional Officer of Rampurhat Subdivision, as our special guest. I would like to request him uh, to share with us his valuable insights uh, on this seminar. Okay. Respected patron and deputy speaker, sir. Respected principal, sir. All the dignitaries, esteemed guests, and delegates of this international seminar. A very, a very good morning to one and all. I would like to extend my gratitude to organizing committee for giving me an opportunity and to be a part of this August international event. And also, I would congratulate and thank Ramburad College for organizing this mega event, international event, in a small but beautiful historical and geographically important town, Ramburhat. Actually, today's topic is regarding geographical research, its multidimensional outlook. The scope of geographical research, research has been increasing, has increased, and this paradigm shift, we all know that this paradigm shift happened or happening for the last several decades. We know that geography, geographical science is such a subject which touches all the aspect of life. And the reason for that, for example, we know that now the environmental science, the scope of environmental science or environmental geography has been increasing because we know that climate change is a reality now. The ice sheets of Antarctica that is melting in a high rate, Amazon rainforest is depleting, the resources are depleting, here comes the environmental geography. And also we know that the population explosion. Population is increasing in a geometrical pro progression, but our resource production is increasing in arithmetic progression. So there is a gap. There comes the economic geography. And also we know that due to climate change and other geopolitical events, Forced displacement and migration is happening all over the world. There comes human geography. And this human geography or anthropography, we know, we know that 
this embraces all other branches of geography or all other dimensions and perspectives of geography. So today, the geographical science is more relevant than any other science. So I extend all my wishes to this August event. Let it be a great success. Thanks to all the delegates. Thanks to all esteemed guests. Thank you. Please, as a speech, please relate to the distribution. Thank you, sir. We are privileged to have as our special guest, Professor Ashish Kumar Panigrahi, Vice Chancellor of Shidhu Kanu Bisha University. Uh, we would like to request uh, Shah to share with us his insights on this seminar. Respected Dr. Asish Benarji, former faculty of the Department of Bengali Rampurat College and the Honorable President of Governing Body Rampurat College and the Honorable Deputy Speaker of Vidhan Sabha West Bengal, who is the Chief Patron of the seminar. Just after delivering a short speech for some business, he has left the seminar hall. Respected other two patrons of the seminar, Dr. Prabal Kumar Sinha, the principal Rampurat College, and Dr. Buddhadev Mukherjee, the Internal Quality Assurance Cell Coordinator and also the Associate Professor, Department of History of Rampurat College. The Honorable Subdivisional Officer of Rampurat Subdivision, respected official delegates of various sponsoring and funding agencies, respected other dignitaries present here on this occasion. Dr. Dear Dr. Jayanto Das, Assistant Professor, Department of Geography and Convener of this seminar, and Mr. Asraful Alam, Assistant Professor, Department of Geography and Organizing Secretary of the seminar. Respected other organizing and managing committee members of the seminar, respected eminent resource persons from a number of countries abroad, as well as from different higher educational institutes of other states across the country, respected other faculties of Rampurat College, my dear students and staff of Rampurat College, Dear delegates and paper presenters, ladies and gentlemen present here, and all other persons present here whose names I have forgotten to mention, very, very warm welcome, my heartfelt greetings and good morning to all of you. It is a great pleasure to me that the Department of Geography, Rampurat College, has organized a two-day international seminar on recent advancement in geographical studies, a multidimensional outlook of which today is the inauguration day. I feel proud of Rampurat College where I had the opportunity to serve 
as a faculty of the Department of Commerce for long 27 years since 1985 to 2012. And now being invited to my previously served college in today's seminar as a special guest, I really feel honored. I am thankful to the faculties and the organizing committee members for such invitation. This seminar has been arranged under the leadership of the Department of Geography in association with Internal Quality Assurance Cell of the college. The seminar has been sponsored by number of reputed agencies like ICSSR, ERC, ACRB, NABAR, NATMO, that is National Atlas and Thematic Mapping Organization, NSI, SOI, ISRS, and DSTBT. The theme of the seminar is also very relevant and contemporary when across the globe threadbare discussions and research have been going on how to combat the threat of climate change, biodiversity, natural disaster, and many other problems like these. Multidimensional approach to geography recognizes that study of geography is not confined in physical landscape but also extends to social and cultural practices of the people of different areas. Now, the geographers are increasingly interested in exploring issues such as migration, identity, and cultural diversity, as well as the complex interactions between people and the environment. Nowadays, the multidimensional outlook on geographical studies highlights the diverse range of approaches and methods that have emerged, reflecting the ever-changing nature of the world. The use of technology-based tools and techniques like remote sensing, that is RS, <coughs> geographical information system, GIS, and global positioning system, GPS, has added a new dimension to the advanced geographical study. <clears throat> a good number of resource persons at international level from higher educational institutes of countries like Bangkok, Thailand, Sydney, Australia, Japan, Taiwan, Iran, Bangladesh, our neighboring country, and the USA. All of them will present their valued deliberations on this occasion. Everyone of us is eager to hear from these eminent educationalists. The other resource persons from reputed higher educational institutes from different states of our country will also speak on various aspects of the theme of the seminar. The researchers and the paper presenters will also cover various issues. I hope during two days' tenure of this international seminar, through deliberations by the resource persons, the delegates, and the paper presenters, most of the issues related to the theme of the seminar will be covered. And through exchange of views, all of us will be able to enrich ourselves in the area of multidimensional outlook of recent advancement in geographical studies to a greater extent. I wish a grand success of this international seminar and I convey my best wishes for the seminar. Thank you all. Jai Hind. Thank you, sir. We are honored to have
Professor Shubhir Sharkar, former professor at the Department of Geography, University of North Bengal, as our special guest. We would love to invite Sir on stage where he will share his insights on this seminar. Please have a round of applause and welcome Sir on stage. Good morning. At the outset, I would like to. Sir, huh? No. I would like to express my heartfelt thanks and gratitude to the organizing committee for inviting me to be here and share the experience. Indeed. A monumental job has been done by the stakeholders of Rampur Hat College. And my, in my last 45 years academic experience, I have never seen this kind, this dimension, this kind of dimension of a seminar, international seminar organized in a, at undergraduate college of the Mafushal town in West Bengal. Indeed, it's a wonderful feast for me. Also, I am proud myself that my student, Jayant, organized this, prog uh, this program in collaboration with his colleagues of this college. I like to express my thanks once again and expecting a grand success of this program. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Now we would like to invite Dr. Joyanto Dash, HOD and Assistant Professor of the Department of Geography and the convener of this seminar to deliver the concept note. Distinguished Chief Patton, respected Patton, esteemed guests and respected speaker, delegates, faculty member, press personnel, and participants. A very good morning and warm welcome to all of you in the inaugural session of the International Seminar on Recent Advancement in Geographical Studies, a multi Your commitment to providing a encouragement and for being the diving force behind the
compassion to all of us. I, I would like to take this moment to express our sincere gratitude to our esteemed special guest, C. R. K. Mina, the director of NATMO. We are truly honored by the presence here today. We would also like to extend our heartfelt appreciation to C. Professor Ashish Kumar Panigrahi, Pro BC, Professor Dhananjoy Jokshit, Vice Chancellor, C. Saddam Nawaz, SGO, C. Shomen, Dr. Sujit Kumar Choudhury, registered of Badawan University, and C. Shomen Bhagod, Chairman of Rampur Municipality. Your esteemed presence and support further inspire us to continue our pursuit of knowledge and innovation. Thank you for guessing this occasion with your presence. I would like to express our sincere gratitude to our, to our sponsor, the Science and Engineering Research Board, Indian Council of Social Science, Delhi, Indian Council of Social Science Research, Eastern Regional Center, National Bank for Agriculture and Rural Development, Survey of India, Anthropological Survey of India, National Atlas and Thematic Mapping Organization, Indian Society of Remote Sensing, Department of Science and Technology and Biotechnology, Rampur Administrability and Advances in Geographical Research for their invitable support and collaboration. We are confident that our collaboration will foster innovation, knowledge sharing and advancement in the field of geography. Also, I would like to take this opportunity to express our deepest gratitude to all the respected speakers who have graciously accepted our invitation and have traveled from different parts of the world to share their expertise with us. Your presence here today underscores the significance of this seminar and the importance of recent advancement in geographical studies. We are eagerly waiting for your valuable insight and contribution, which will undoubtedly enrich our understanding and create space for further research in this multidimensional field. I am taking this opportunity to share with you that it's proud moment for the Rampurat College the fraternity that about 318 papers presenter, 16 poster presenter, 24 model presenter from all over the India and different parts of the world, especially Bangladesh, Somalia, Ethiopia, Nigeria, Thailand are participating in this seminar. This robust participation is indicative of the vibrant academic community that thrives on knowledge exchange collaborative exploration and multidisciplinary engagement. It is an inspiration for us to organize such as auspicious event again in the future. To all the esteemed delegates and participants, I extend my warmest welcome. Your presence here is a testament to our commitment to the field of geographical studies and your enthusiasm for knowledge sharing and collaboration. This seminar provides us with an opportunity to force new connection and exchange ideas among geographer, scholar from allied discipline. I am confident that the interaction and disc discussion that take place during the course of the seminar will pave the way for new research collaboration, innovative solution to the complex challenges we face in the field of geography. The seminar, the theme of this seminar, recent advancement in geographical studies, a multidimensional outlook reflect the transformative development that have taken place in the field of geography. Geographical studies have expanded beyond the traditional boundaries, encompassing technological advancement, social and cultural dimension, sustainability, and interdisciplinary research. This seminar aims to provide a platform for scholars to explore these dimensions and to showcase the latest research tools, methodology in geography. By doing so, we aspire to contribute to the advancement of geographical knowledge and practice. We have curated a diverse range of sub-themes that encompasses emerging concept and methods in different bands of geography. These sub-themes reflect the multidimensional nature of geography that highlight the needs for interdisciplinary collaboration and innovative approach to address the complex challenges of our time. I would like to extend my heartfelt appreciation to our organizing secretary, Mr. Ashabul Alam, 
Assistant Professor, Department of Geography, Ramprat College, Associate Organizing Committee members, faculty, staff, and my dear student who have worked tirelessly behind the scene to make this seminar a reality. This commitment, dedication, and attention to detail have ensured the smooth functioning of this event. I would also like to express my gratitude to all the participants for their active involvement, for sharing their research, ex research experiences and perspective. Your contribution will undoubtedly enrich the discussion and inspire future research in geographical studies. Once again, I extend my warmest welcome to all of you, and I hope that this seminar will be a memorable and enriching experience for each and every one of us. Let us seize this opportunity to explore the recent advancement in geographical studies, post new connection, and collectively contribute to the progress and development of our field. Thank you, and I wish all you a successful and fruitful seminar. Thank you again. Thank you, sir. It's a great honor and pleasure for us that we have with us Professor Joanne K. Routre, Professor. Professor, Professor Jayant K. Rautre is the Professor Emeritus at the Asian Institute of Technology, Bangkok, Thailand. He will deliver the keynote address of the seminar. Professor Rautre is widely recognized for his profound knowledge and expertise in the field of rural regional development and disaster management. And his contributions to research and academia are highly regarded worldwide. The title of his keynote address is Natural Hazards and Disaster Dynamics Studies in Geography, Scope for Disaster Management and Research. We would like to invite Professor Joan Kirautri to deliver the keynote address. We wish his valuable insights promise, promises to be enlightening, thought-provoking, and inspiring for all of us. This light. This light. Huh. Not good. Maybe that standing uh, microphone will be better. Huh? Yeah, this is obstruct. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, distinguished guests, speakers, fellow participants, and geographers. This is a great pleasure for me to be part of this international conference. Actually, the theme is very interesting, and it is not a one-time job. We have to keep on doing and uh, reviewing what is happening in our discipline and keep on publishing 
and uh, taking the updates and making use in our respective research fields. So my topic is natural hazards and disaster dynamic studies in geography, scope for disaster management and research. And why I chose this particular topic? The uh, organizers requested me uh, to speak um, on two important streams of geography, that is uh, physical stream as well as uh, human geography stream. But I have chosen the topic in a way it meets the requirement of uh, both the fields, like uh, physical geography as well as, uh, say, uh, human geography. So if you can put my slides on, I think it will be useful. Slides, yeah. Hmm. And, um, yeah, put on my slides. has two main streams, physical geography as well as human geography. And we have scope to go beyond its traditional, say, boundary. And uh, next question comes that uh, the topic I have chosen, it comes within physical as well as, uh, say, human geography. So it satisfies uh, to all of you in the context of the recent advancement in geography. And this is very uh, specific. And this area of study is not so much explored by geographers. Of course, I have seen in the abstract volume, there are many papers relating to, say, natural hazards and disasters. And when I look for journals, publications, I don't find much, say, intensive and in-depth studies conducted by our friends and published in those respective journals. So now, why this particular uh, study is very important? Because uh, now frequency and intensity of natural hazards are in the increasing order year by year due to climate change and geotectonic processes. This is the fact. And climate change induced hazards and disasters have catalyzed to prioritize the focus on associated and contemporary issues. Therefore, disaster science and management 
the studies have evolved as a multidisciplinary discipline that addresses broadly the topics such as response, recovery, reconstruction, structural and non-structural mitigation, as well as say, preparedness. And in the disaster management cycle, basically these aspects are very much highlighted and they follow from response to reconstruction, recovery and mitigation and preparedness. These are four basic steps and we can enlarge those steps uh, in a more detailed way. And disaster managers around the globe, they use this kind of framework. And geography departments offering courses on climatology and natural disasters with additional inputs on disaster impact studies will be able to contribute substantially through studies and research on disaster science and disaster management. And as far as natural disasters are concerned, I have taken some historical facts, particularly from Indian context, and I will not go in details, and uh, the purpose of uh, putting those into slides just to give a kind of uh, refreshment so that you can recollect what has happened in our uh, Indian subcontinent in different states, and we have to learn lessons from them, and probably that will justify the need for establishing such kind of departments. So there are few, say, examples cited uh, from landslides and uh, current landslides in uh, Simla, Himachal Pradesh, just uh, last month. And also in the past, there are many other places, uh, including Kedarnath landslide, and uh, uh, recent uh, meaning uh, in the in, in uh, 2000 we have mumbai landslides and uh, why i have cited and taken examples because we have to learn a lot and those who are really disastrous and uh, we lost human life and assets and resources and everything and coming to earthquake then we have also uh, say assam earthquake in 2021 kashmir uh, 2013 Andaman Islands that was in August 2009 and again Kashmir uh, 2005 and then Andaman earthquake 2002 and accompanied with destructive tsunami and that that is should be remembered and of course Bhuj Gujarat earthquake still very fresh in our mind and the idea is that sometimes we try to take note of those kind of incidents and uh, the management aspect, the operational aspect are taken over by the other field level, say, organizations and officials. And as geographers, we have very important roles to play in this respect. And then coming to flood and cyclone, so I have highlighted six floods that devastated India recently, one in Kerala, and Chennai, Jammu and Kashmir, Uttarakhand, and Assam, and then Mumbai also. And we face and experience a frequent flooding situation now in almost all urban areas because of other regions, like we are not able to manage our drainage system. So therefore, all those urban areas having uh, say a uh, uh, good infrastructure facility are unable to handle the flooding situation and as far as cyclones are concerned then odisha super cyclone 1999 that set the agenda how to address disaster management in our country through the initiative of undp program during that time and cyclone Amphan that uh, devastated bengal and partially odisha and uh, Cyclone Tauke, Gujarat, Cyclone Foni recently in Puri district and also Cyclone Oki wrecking havoc in Kerala and Tamil Nadu. So these are the things that uh, we noticed and we have experience as individuals and also we have experience as uh, professionals and we have experience as the persons working in this particular field of study. And as far as droughts are concerned, one-sixth of the area of our country uh, under, uh, say, drought. And this is a very serious issue. And uh, most of them are meteorological and also hydrogeological. 
and therefore we have to be very very careful in addressing the drought situation and the areas actually lies in arid and semi arid areas rajasthan gujarat maharashtra and semi areas of madhya pradesh and other uh, parts of the country also not free from drought situation because due to lack of irrigation say, facilities and because of the say climate change issues we have shifting seasonality and uh, no prediction about to the adequacy of the rainfall that can be used for cropping and other activities so therefore this is a big issue for us and coming to climate change actually i have taken some of the points from the ipcc latest report and these are some of the recommendations for the policy makers meaning that we have to emphasize on policy related issues and address through our say research and provide some practical say solution so this is one area where uh, we have to provide solutions for uh, practicing purposes and simple general recommendation will not do to overcome the issues of uh, natural hazards and disasters and uh, the other point that ipcc panel always conducting studies involving the scientists globally regionally nationally and locally and their say predictions in terms of global warming and uh, say regarding the uh, say, uh, say say rainfall pattern and uh, drought situation and cyclone and everything uh, their predictions to be taken note of translating those into practical say actions and lessons so this is where ipcc is very very say important and a number of say scientists working there and we as geographers we have to take note of their findings and making the best use of those findings in the localities influenced by climate change for in depth and intensive local level studies to provide remedial measures and solutions and then uh, taking these uh, say uh, facts into consideration there is a need for disaster science and management and uh, m- most of you might be knowing that uh, it is already established uh, like a discipline meaning multidiscipline where social scientists and climatologist and uh, then meteorologist and uh, uh, engineers and other uh, say policy um, uh, oriented people are working on this particular topic including the geographers they do lot of activities and why this particular study is needed say controlling and managing disaster induced impacts on settlements population then natural and built environment economy business and livelihood etc so this is the biggest challenging area where we can contribute a lot those who are really doing or conducting research in the field of so social geography or human geography so impact study impact analysis is very very important and addressing the impacts on the affected areas and then enhancing response mechanism and then preparing for disaster management so we have to say improve our readiness to address the issues following the occurrence of a disaster these are the topics address under preparedness and in the current situation we have a number of say institutional mechanism and mostly those aspect are handled by the technocrats and bureaucrats at the field level situation but they need to be supported with scientific studies and recommendation to make themselves ready under preparedness i'll come later and then the current situation is focus on disaster risk reduction a great paradigm shift from relief to disaster risk reduction that doesn't mean that we need not have to focus on relief measures 
it will be there. But to reduce the load, to reduce the um, say impact, to reduce other things, we have to see how best we can reduce the risk that is coming out of different types of disasters. And promoting climate and disaster resilient policies, programs and activities based on our research and documentation, then the government and the bodies concerned for policy say formulation, they have to focus on all these things. Like, uh, say, what are the advancement in this particular field? When we say advancement, actually it needs a thorough review of works done maybe during last decade or last two decades or even last three decades. It is a huge work. But based on my interest and involvement in this particular area of research over last two and a half decades and conducting several studies, I try to put not exactly what is happening, but indirectly I try to put my ideas what has been done and what should be done in future. And as far as this advancement is concerned, these are taking place regularly in this field contributions made through in different uh, research programs and also published in international say, peer uh, research uh, review reports. And what IPCC does, they try to see first as a part of the review what kind of works have been done in this particular area and in different countries, different localities. They try to collect the best, say, papers and make the best use of it while preparing their IPCC report in addition to assigning specific tasks to specific scientific groups to address different aspects of climate change in which say disaster risk reduction is very very important and key issue to be addressed. So then the question comes the key areas within this field are broadly disaster risk reduction, DRR, well-known mitigation, both structural and non-structural, then vulnerability, then coping, adaptive capacity, and then adaptation and resilience per se. So these are the topics covered under this, and you'll find plenty of research already gone into it. But sometimes we ourselves very much uh, say confused with the different kinds of terminology and key concept used under this, but uh, we have to review how people have defined and applied in respective research context. And when we try to conduct or start our own research, probably we have to take some of the definition already used and to operationalize in our research, we have to define in our own way so that our research findings and outputs will be very, very clear and will be useful for making practical purposes. And qualitative and quantitative assessment techniques for risk, already there, lot of techniques have been evolved. Then hazards, vulnerability, and adaptive capacity coping is the current thrust on different disaster studies while profiling disaster and its impact areas with specific areas and locations are equally important. When we start, we have to justify, yes, it is a disaster prone, maybe cyclone prone, maybe flood prone, maybe say a landslide prone. And I have seen in the abstract there are many uh, say papers appeared in the abstract volume. And then uh, remote sensing and GIS uh, tools have to play a greater role. And uh, from this point of view, you will find a lot of applications already available published through say research journals. And then disaster governance is the current issue very much focused and the social capital aspect and polity related studies are taken up doing with the key areas as mentioned above. And as far as disaster ma say management cycle is concerned because all those key say terms and areas of research link to disaster management cycle and basically it has four broad say categorical steps. First one is response under which search and rescue, then evacuation, relief operations, food, water and medicines and of course emergency management is very very important as a part of this. So 
many scholars have developed the methodology and conducted studies how to improve emergency management in a very, say, context-specific, area-specific, as well as the disaster-specific emergency management system. Some of them have commonalities, generic aspect, but uh, within that also we have to focus on specific aspects. And then uh, recovery and construction, that is the second level, very, very important. Immediately after uh, the disaster strikes, then naturally, say, people are engaged in recovery and reconstruction, and maybe it is for a short-term process. And real, say, rehabilitation and reconstruction activities take place much longer, cannot be finished even within a year. And mitigation is very important, structural mitigation as well as non-structural mitigation. And when we say structural mitigation, maybe the engineering aspect, the infrastructural aspect, and non-structural, even preparing a disaster management plan, creating awareness among people and making them well prepared, understanding the, the potential impacts of individual say, disasters, part of the non-structural mitigation. And uh, these aspects also very much uh, supplement and uh, complement the prepare, preparedness component of disaster management cycle. Under preparedness, always we talk, say, only warning system. And uh, nowadays, very much we are talking forced evacuation, forced evacuation. And uh, it is very much in practice in the context of Odisha by the government. And they have experimented many times on different occasions. And as per uh, their policy statement, that uh, every life is important to the government and achieving zero casualty is the policy uh, option. And therefore, the government uh, doesn't like to take any risk and they force people to evacuate and uh, depending on the only warning system and the intensity of the event going to happen. And this is very common. This is possible in our, say, country situation, and we may apply forced evacuation, but in Western countries, people do not accept this concept. The reason is very simple, that uh, they value their individual rights, personal rights, and they say it is we to decide whether to evacuate or not. It is not the, say, uh, administrative decision to be followed on this area. And under preparedness, uh, say, shelter, camps, and logistics to be provided, and institutional coordination is very, very, say, important. And then uh, I have, uh, uh, say, a few slides on key terms and how it has been defined. And I have um, taken from different sources and tried to make it as simple as possible. And uh, you can uh, use it and try to check and verify in your own, say, context. I am not going to, say, uh, tell about all those things. So disaster, hazard, because these are key terms when you start your research. You have to be very, very clear. Otherwise, you are caught up with those words and cannot proceed further. And now the term exposure and sensitivity is very much, uh, say, used uh, in climate change science and IPCC documents. Uh, say we have to understand say uh, what is exposure and uh, the sensitivity meaning uh, the degree uh, of uh, uh, being easily influenced by uh, some sort of say uh, natural hazards and disaster and exposure may be say how many days you are living in the flood one week one month three months this is in one sense and uh, the other way we can say what was the depth of flood water, whether it was on the street or it was inside the house, one feet, two feet, three feet, uh, makes a big difference. So therefore, we have to use this. And in disaster science, this exposure and sensitivity aspects are covered under vulnerability analysis. And always uh, the people work uh, in the um, uh, climate science and uh, IPCC and all that 
uh, they don't use uh, so much the uh, concept of vulnerability, though it is there, but they try to define that vulnerability in terms of exposure and sensitivity. And coping, uh, that is to be understood how people cope uh, with, say, a particular disaster, meaning living with the disaster, living inside the flood water, how do they manage, how do they cope, and that is a very short-term approach. Coping is a very short-term. And then preparedness, I have already mentioned, and then uh, risk is very, very, say, important. And uh, say, any disaster study without risk analysis is incomplete. We simply cannot justify without risk analysis. So risk arises from the combination of hazards, exposure of people and assets to the hazards and their vulnerabilities and coping capacity at a particular incident or event. There are two types of risk, perceived risk and actual risk. And what is that uh, perceived risk? People try to focus before the onset of any kind of disaster. They try to see things, meaning project and envision what is going to happen in their own way. But in reality, those kind of uh, perception may not actually uh, happen or may happen more than the perceived ones. So always there is a gap between perceived and uh, actual, say, risk. And this adaptation uh, is the term used both in disaster science as well as climate science and resilience also very much used. And what is that adaptation, the process of adjusting to natural and social environmental condition either at in C2 or at alternative new location. I mean, how people try to adapt, where are they at present? Or if they are asked to move out and taken to a new location, then say, how do they adjust? So adaptation mechanism, strategy principle will be quite different from in C2 and also in a new location. A lot of challenges in new location. And it is very much challenging for the facilitator, for the managers, and for the technocrats. But maybe it is easier if we have option to settle them at in C2. So we have to be very, very careful. And a lot of studies have been conducted in the context of in C2 and uh, say outside or new location adaptation. And what is this uh, resilience? Resilience is the capacity to withstand or to recover quickly from disaster induced say difficulties, losses, or bouncing back to, to achieve normalcy. Maybe easy to say, but difficult to say operationalize. So we say resilient economy, resilient livelihood, and uh, say uh, people use very much say climate uh, resilient say programs and activities, how we can help people in this way. And then disaster governance, this basically talks about the institutional mechanism, policy framework, legal tools, and the guidebook, guidelines, and so on and so forth. And then using all these, we have to make disaster risk management. And I will illustrate uh, one example, how uh, we do uh, risk analysis. And social capital uh, is not very much, uh, say, addressed as a part of say, disaster uh, management uh, um, aspect, but uh, this has, uh, this is a very important tool to be played with, and uh, some of my students have already done the pioneer work and using social capital, and uh, based on my experience from my childhood, I have seen the first help comes from the community and using the social capital, that is the strength of managing, say, internally, so internal, and if we fail to manage internally, then certainly we'll bank upon the external resources and so on and so forth. And then another term is very prominent, say, build back better, BBB, that is a concept and used in many different research articles, and this is very much practice oriented. That means we have to make the new constructions, infrastructure development, and structural mitigation in a way that will stand against the upcoming, say, natural calamities or disasters and natural hazards. 
and uh, uh, this particular approach is very much followed in Japanese uh, disaster management activities. They are um, so one way a rich country and uh, technologically very much uh, advanced and uh, they go for immediate uh, infrastructure development. For example, say after Tohoku tsunami in 2011, uh, I made a field study uh, say after two, three years, got the opportunity to visit and they have restored back everything and you will find say uh, no uh, say physical waste and everything is cleaned up, leveled up with the new infrastructure and ready to attract uh, the old settlers or even for new settlements and they have raised the dike level with a, a, a monument that this is the level uh, during 2011 and they have enhanced, increased the level of the dike at least two meters plus so that they can prevent in future such kind of calamities if it is going to happen. And this build back better, BBB, is a very strong concept. And in our system, whatever infrastructure we are developing today, it does not stand even our road construction, maintenance and management. After one rainy season, everything, the top is out and not uh, usable. So this concept is very much important and they have demonstrated with the technology and uh, practical lessons and they have developed a lot of documents how we can focus on this. And the UN also emphasize on this when they address disaster risk reduction. So coming just for one example, risk analysis and what is this risk. So any disaster related study without addressing the risk issue, the study is incomplete. Nobody will value it. So therefore, what is that risk? Uh, risk is a function of hazard vulnerability and coping capacity or adaptive capacity. In climate change, they say adaptive capacity, it is meaning the same, but it's a question of interpretation and choosing the variables and parameters uh, to explain it. And then uh, I mentioned what is that vulnerability. Vulnerability is a state of the situation, say economic, social, institutional, and so on and so forth. It is a function of exposure and sensitivity. So this is very, very important. And when we uh, measure this vulnerability, so it is simply the product of both exposure and, say, sensitivity. So mathematically, risk is directly proportional to the product of H and B, hazard and vulnerability, and inversely proportional to C or adaptive capacity. And when you search for different kinds of journals, so many authors, they try to defend and interpret and analyzing using this concept of vulnerability, but mathematical formulation is quite different. And we broke our head through our research and to justify and identify to an acceptable concept and the mathematical formulation, drawing the lessons from others. So this is what we have used it in many different uh, say risk analysis study. So therefore, finally, the risk can be expressed R. R is the risk factor equal to H into B and uh, divided by C. And B, we can replace the product of exposure and sensitivity and uh, how to do it. And then we will have, say, a set of variables. are capable of enough to address those issues internally. 
but in reality we don't get the value of one either it is more than one and less than one and if it is more than one meaning our adoptive and coping capacity is weak poor so therefore we have to think how to reduce that will help us uh, that uh, disaster risk reduction of many other things how we can reduce so that coping capacity or adaptive capacity of people will be enhanced so that they can cope up better and if it is uh, uh, less than one meaning uh, uh, say if it is more than one then these are the implications and if it is less than one meaning risk is less than one meaning people are doing fine and uh, we may give them further inputs so that they can perform still better and reduce the risk factor much, much lower than one. So this is how we can do it. And some of my uh, students' research studies we have conducted, say, uh, both uh, actual risk and also, uh, say, uh, perceived risk and establish the relationship uh, in, in this respect. And there is a high positive correlation between, uh, say, active, perceived and active so perceived risk is very much reflected within the active but uh, not vice versa so therefore when we conduct such kind of studies it is a guideline and helping us to streamline some of the parameters and variables how we can use for risk reduction measures and uh, then comes different research areas i will not uh, go uh, say line by line i have three slides and uh, that reflects a number of research topics that uh, geographers can do much better and uh, they can select and try to uh, understand and conduct research and can contribute uh, in a very uh, uh, nice way. And uh, then I have also some uh, topics. It is not just I am proposing you a number of topics and not that it has been studied and myself conducted in many different kinds of say research within disaster management and science through my doctoral and master students and at least 30 40 studies i conducted and published in international peer-reviewed journals and very highly accredited and some of the articles have 100 plus minus citations meaning that people use it and they find value in those kind of uh, say research. So I have a, a list that research conducted in the field of disaster science and management, meaning that I highlighted the research conducted by me and my students. Those are the things I have highlighted and other scholars have also done similar uh, studies uh, in different contexts and different areas. So this is for your say, reference. And then I will come to help you uh, to understand that uh, we try to publish uh, in uh, say local, regional, even national journals and uh, um, sometimes uh, the uh, outputs, research contributions are not well received and well say recognized by say other scholars. They don't make use of our uh, contributions unless it is say reviewed and published in uh, say international journals this is very very important it is not difficult and what i have done i have a say long list of say journals dedicated very much devoted very much for addressing different aspects of disaster science and disaster management and in my list say in the first slide uh, so you can move on so uh, say journals devoted to disaster research in the first slide, move, 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 please move. Just go to journals, journals. So slide number 16, slide number 16. And uh, yes, here I, I have a list of say journals and uh, I put those journals, they are uh, very high rated and uh, say, uh, well cited and used journals and in this say uh, list at least uh, uh, my students myself have published enormously uh, in this class size journals almost one two three four five articles here and journal two the second slide 
and you will find also the list dedicated, devoted for, say, disaster science and management. And uh, um, then I will come to the, uh, the last uh, but one slide, like um, two slides I have more. And uh, because it is a very growing field and probably we geographers are recognizing but not so seriously to take note of it, how important it is in our country context, our state context and also local organization context. So disaster science and management, there are many academic programs and you can go next, next, yes. So there are different programs, well established. I have taken note of it and 100% devoted for disaster management, you know, and uh, uh, in, uh, in our country. And uh, only I found the good program, and that is disaster management program at the Tata Institute of Social Science. And full-fledged programs where geographers are also enrolled and they uh, take studies and research. And at Asian Institute of Technology, myself was given the responsibility and I established the, uh, the program and nurtured it for 15 years at a stretch and established master's program, doctoral program, and also training, consulting program, and also established academic programs in other countries like Pakistan and Sudan based on our experience. And what I would like to uh, say, submit before you that uh, geog as geographers, we have the skill and potential to work in this direction. And within geography, you can have a full-fledged specialization on disaster management and science-related issues. Or even the universities can think for, say, establishing new departments, addressing these areas of research is very, very important. And uh, we must not, say, forget about it. And at the end, so what is my intention through this presentation? My intention is very clear. The intention of this research is to stimulate and encourage geographers to focus on disaster studies and research within geography discipline. And uh, I strongly believe that Indian geographers can make substantial contribution to this growing field of disaster science and management. And while reviewing the journal articles, say around the globe, there are many, say, top contributors. They, if you say, very carefully scan their, say, background, they're geographers. They come forward and they contribute in the forefront of this particular subject and complemented and supplemented by, say, other disciplines. So my point is we have a role to play and I hope uh, we can do uh, together. And uh, at the end, I must uh, uh, say, submit that if anybody needs my help in this respect to develop curriculum and uh, to help you in your research program and all that, I'm available. So that is not a big issue and I have I must uh, say, uh, claim that I have a good exposure and experience and I feel confident and because of my work, experience and contributions. And if you uh, search and certainly you will find my name uh, in, the, in this particular field. So thank you uh, very much for your attention and with this I conclude. Thank you. I finish and I hope they will circulate this kind of things for your benefit so everything is documented here so I finish anything more okay.
Thank you, sir, for your enlightening presentation. Uh, now I would like to welcome on stage Mr. Ashraful Alam, Assistant Professor, Department of Geography, Rampurhat College, and the Organizing Secretary of this seminar to deliver the vote of thanks. Ashraful. Good afternoon, everyone. Distinguished delegates, honorable guests, uh, respected faculty members, and esteemed participants and enthusiastic participants, it is with a great pleasure that, as Organizing Secretary, extend a warm welcome to you all to the International Seminar on Recent Advancement in Geographical Studies, a multinational outlook organized by the Department of Geography at Amparat College. As Organizing Secretary, I am honored to share details of this significant academic event that promises to be a platform for insightful discussions, knowledge exchange, and fostering the collab um, collaborations in the field of geography. This seminar has been a culmination of months of meticulous planning, dedicated for understanding was to create a platform that fosters to exchange the ideas, knowledge, and experiences, and I believe we have succeeded in achieving just that. I would like to express my deep gratitude to all our distinguished delegates who have traveled for and wide to share their insights and expertise. Your presence has enriched this gathering and has provided us with fresh perspectives that will undoubtedly influence the trajectory of our field. I extend my heartfelt gratitude to the chief patron of this seminar, Dr. Ashish Banerjee, whose unwavering support and invaluable suggestions enriching our endeavor profoundly. His guidance fuels our determinations to excel and his belief strengthens our purpose. I am deeply thankful to our esteemed for educational excellence. Inspired us to undertake a seminar which aims to enrich our academic landscapes. I would also like to express my sincere appreciation to Dr. Buddhadev Mukherjee, according to IQSC, Rampurhat College. His dedication to quality enhancement in academia has been pivotal in shaping this seminar. His meticulous planning and insightful contributions have added a unique dimension to our preparations to execute this event. We are fortunate to have generated honorable support from our dedicated faculties of Rampurhat College, whose commitment to academic excellence has been a driving force behind the successful organization of this seminar. I extend my appreciation to our sponsors and partners whose contributions have made this event financially viable and have allowed us to maintain the high standards we envisioned. The esteemed sponsors including renowned agencies such as Science and Engineering Research Board, Indian Council of Social Science Research, National Bank for Agriculture and Rural Development Survey of India, Anthropology Survey of India, National Atlas and Thematic Mapping Organizations, Indian Society of Remote Sensing and the Department of Science and Technology and Biotechnology, Government of West Bengal. Underscore the significance of this seminar. Their contributions have enabled us to bring together eminent scholars, researchers and practitioners on a common platform to deliberate upon the latest advancement and trends in geographical studies. I would like to express my heartful uh, gratitude to Rampart Municipality, whose commitment towards academic excellence has been a driving force behind the successful organization of the seminar. Uh, in closing, I would like to express my heartful gratitude to each one of you for your unwavering support, enthusiasm, and participation. I must acknowledge the hard work of the organizing committee and the volunteers, especially volunteers, who have worked uh, tirelessly behind the scene of the ensure the seamless executions of every aspect of the seminars. Your dedications and enthusiasm have been commendable. Thank you all. Now I request all to kindly stand up for our national anthem, which will be followed by a short tea break of five minutes, after which we will gather again for Professor S.P. Chatterjee Memorial Lecture.
सामने थे कैसे छोड़ जाओ प्लीज भाई थैंक यू रेडी स्टार्ट वन टू थ्री स्टार्ट
하나 둘 
a distinguished personality in the field of cartography and geographical sciences. He will deliver SP Chatterjee Memorial Lecture. Dr. Prithvi Shnak has had an illustrious career serving as the former surveyor of General of India. For Sciences are widely recognized and celebrated. Dr. Nock's extensive knowledge and experience make him the perfect choice to deliver S.P. Chatterjee Memorial Lecture, which honors the legacy of a renowned figure in the field of geography and allied sciences. <clears throat> we would like to invite Dr. Prithvish Nath to deliver the S.P. Chatterjee Memorial Lecture. The title of his address is Relevance of the Contributions of Professor S.P. Chatterjee. His expertise and profound understanding will undoubtedly enrich our understanding of this, of this subject and inspire us to delve deeper into the realms of geography and related disciplines. Over to you, sir. Good afternoon. I have been given the duty to stand in front of you between the inaugural session and the lunch. And it is really a task for a speaker to draw the attention of the audience when lunch is to be served soon. I will try to make the lecture as interesting as possible not very heavily loaded in theories, but how Professor Chatterjee did his work, how he contributed his life, so that people like us should draw inspiration. He was teacher of teachers in geography in the country. In simple Bihari language, Guru ka Guru, Guru Sar Sarra, this is the term used for people like him. So it is difficult to, to analyze everything, what he contributed, how he was instrumental in getting the Indian geography and applied side of Indian geography flourished. Friends, today the topic is recent advancement in geography. We have been hearing by different speakers, if we don't make geography relevant, we are nowhere. If we don't tune our studies and researches to the national requirement, we are redundant. What Professor Chatterjee did during his time, what was required, the advancement was required, that he picked up. And he focused on that. The question arises whether we, the Indian geographers, have picked up those issues which are currently required, currently at the forefront in national development planning, management, etc. If we have done your doing, we are important. Or otherwise, we keep on talking about recent developments, but not actually doing recent developments. 
So hence, the relevance of the contribution of, if I, if I should say, the Professor Chatterjee model of development of geography during that perspective has to be seen in the current perspective as well. Next, please. I understand remote is coming, and I will be as quick as possible. I tried to squeeze whatever information I had into 90 slides, and sometimes each slides are having two or three pictures also. I could not reduce this further. I totally agree, more than 40 slides is not bearable by the listeners. But I will try to skip and try to make it as interesting as possible. So this was last, this was his <coughs> uh, biographical details. I will come to it one by one and explain to you and I try to track down about his life and work, etc. Next, please. He, he did his MSc Geology from Banaras Hindu University. And I got the photograph of the Department of Geology of Banaras Hindu University. Friends, this is the Goldsmith College in London, where he went for his PhD in education. So he was doing DLIT as well in Paris and PhD in Goldsmith College. Next, please. This is the group photograph, 1932-33. The earliest photograph of Professor Chatterjee I could get. I'm zooming the part where he is there. Next, please. You can see he's sitting in the center. His age was only 29 years. Very handsome, tall, big built, and as it says, he was wearing the Oxford bag, which is fashionable during those times. Next, please. Last year, I happened to be in Paris, and as I was trekking down his trail, I went to the University de Paris, Sorbonne, where Professor Chatterjee did his delit and the famous thesis, which was published in 1936 from Paris, and later we also published it. I will come to it later. Plateau de Meghalaya, and this is how the name Meghalaya came into existence. Next, please. These are the I try to enlist his contributions. Starting from teaching in geography, geographical society, geography, national planning, national atlas, all sort of things. It was difficult for me to cover all these 13 major fields of his contribution into this presentation. So some contributions I have included in details, and some I left by giving a running reference. Next, please. In teaching, after doing his MSc in geology from BHU, he landed in University of Rangoon. Friends, Rangoon has got a very important place in Indian geography. I repeat, Rangoon has got a very important place in Indian geography. Two of the professors and doyens of Indian geography, both geologists, both from Banaras in the University. They landed up in Department of Geography in Rangoon University. Professor Chibbar and Professor Chatterjee. Both came back respectively to the, their places. Professor Chatterjee came to Calcutta University and he established the Department, etc. I'll come to it. And Professor Shibbar also 
he established geography department at Banaras Hindu University. And both the departments were premier departments of the country till now. So hence, Rangoon was very much in my mind. Next, please. I went for boundary settlement as a leader of the government of India with Burma. And I landed up in Rangoon. And I tried to visit that department, which is, has got so much impact on Indian geography. It was a, today also it, is, it was a military rule. I tried twice, two days, but nobody was saying anything. Finally, I asked Indian embassy that what is the problem? They were saying that Rangoon University is closed for two years. They are not allowing anybody to go. So I was very disheartened. I roamed around Rangoon. Next, please. And where I landed up is the Mazar of the last emperor of India, Bahadur Shah Jafar. And this is in the basement where Bahadur Shah Jafar was imprisoned and in the, in, with help of coal, Koila, he wrote the famous lines, Do Gaj Jameena Mili. It was the wall of that basement. Next, I come to the postgraduate teaching. It started in 1941. Senate Hall, you can see. I am not reading everything. I leave it to you to read whatever is interesting. Otherwise, we don't have time. Next, please. He got a lot of support from Shama Prasad Mukherjee. And due to him, it was possible to establish a full-fledged geography department in Calcutta University. Next, please. This was the old Asutosh building. Geography department was divided into three parts. The Senate Hall, now demolished, Darbhanga building, and Ashutosh building. So it was split into three parts. Next, please. Darbhanga Hall was having all sort of labs, etc., from 1939 to 1962. Next, please. Professor Chatterjee, with the, his background and with his closer association with Dudley Stamp, wanted to do field work and field-based information that he wanted to map. So that he carried out. Next, please. He was also a political map maker. The participants who have come from Bangladesh, it would be interesting for, for them as well. Had his cartographic products available before the Red Cliff Award, the partition boundaries would have been different. Next, please. And his contribution, the cartographic depiction, was published from the Geographical Society of India, one of the monograph, earlier monograph of Professor Chatterjee is on that. Those who are interested in this may please go through it. Next, please. This is the work taken from his famous book, Bengal in Maps. And he plotted the Hindu and Muslim population and tried to make a boundary, which something came out like this. So Bengal in Maps was published by Orient Longman. Next, please. Later, we from National Atlas of Thematic Mapping Organization reprint the whole atlas and is available on sale as well. This is the original Bengalian maps forward by Shama Prasad Mukherjee. Next, please. Uh, as I mentioned, that the, this, this atlas was a forerunner of several things. In the preface, Professor Chatterjee mentioned that had the maps been in print before the final award of 
Sir Cecil Redcliffe. There <coughs> would perhaps have been more reasonable partition of Bengal to the satisfaction of the two major communities of the province, Hindus and Muslims. Next, please. What of appreciation he got for this work from Pandit Jawaharlal Nehru, from Shah Prasad, Balabhai Patel, etc. And that made an entry for the establishment of national, then National Atlas Organization. Next, please. A brief letter was written to Pandit Jawaharlal Nehru and he, he gave green signal for National Atlas project then. I am talking about 1954. Surveying etc. he wanted to integrate the detailed survey part for preparation of the National Atlas itself. Next please. Uh, 19, he proposed the National Atlas project in 1944. Please remember the chronology. National Atlas project and then National Atlas Organization and that National Atlas and Thematic Mapping Organization. Next please. The proposed atlas was to map natural conditions, natural resources, economic development of the country. And it was published from the Survey of India, Calcutta office, which had the best uh, printing uh, facilities during that time. Next please. Objective we can see to map the socioeconomic pattern, resources, and the regional account. Uh, we have been knowing and discussing about the contribution of Professor Chatterjee, but hardly it has been discussed that what was his contribution to regional geography. This is a very important aspect which should be highlighted. I'm trying to highlight that. Next, please. <coughs> the National Atlas of India project was approved. The initial project was having 600 plates. Ultimately, the first edition was having around 50. The second edition, which was completed during my time, was having 300. Third edition is yet to come. So he had a very big plan for preparing the National Atlas. Next, please. This is what the National Atlas, the, pre, the front page of National Atlas looks like. Next, please. Friends, this is another very old photograph I could gather. You can see Professor Chatterjee. The next person, I presume he is Dudley Stamp. I, I tried to get his picture from the website, which is there at the corner. There are resemblance, but not, I am not sure. Next is S.P. Dash Gupta, the second di director. Then is S.C. Bose. Then is, uh, anybody can identify? Next. I'll tell you, I'm forgetting. And then the Vice Chancellor of Calcutta University, S.N. Sin. So the National Atlas first edition was presented to Dudley Stamp who visited Natbo and that was his second visit to Natbo. Next please. <coughs> uh, we had a conference in uh, 2007 where Professor Omerling, IC Secretary General came. He knew the whole development of National Atlas of India and his comments during the conference was that it, to, but it was difficult to make a uniform base at one is to one million. Then generalize the issues and to make some sense out of it. Produce uniform views at one is to six million scale and also overcome the massive data collection and in the pre-computer age, the huge data collection those who, who could recall the, the older students of Calcutta University, that student volunteers were engaged from Calcutta University and neighboring universities to participate in the data collection and processing. 
because there were no computers then. And I'd like to add an anecdote that whenever I went to Europe and US, I met a lot of students, male and female. They used to come and meet me and they used to say that, okay, we have worked in National Atlas Organization as a student volunteer. They are quite senior person, more, more than my age, but they had that type of attachment with National Atlas Thematic Mapping Organization. Basically, students coming out from Calcutta University, coming out from the colleges in and around Calcutta University. Next, please. Now, Professor Chatterjee was not satisfied with whatever was done till then. He wanted Research Institute of Geography. His objective was that not to have a National Atlas Organization or not even to have a National Atlas and Thematic Mapping Organization. Next, please. <coughs> These are the important contributions. Next, please. The, the, the book, the, his delete on the left hand side, Le Plateau de Meghalaya, 1936, it was in French from Professor S.P. Chatterjee Memorial Foundation. We got it translated into English. Professor S.P. Das Gupta, the second director of NATMO, he translated from French to English. And this volume, this book has been produced, which gives a vivid account of that plateau, Meghalaya, and the name which came out of it. Next, please. In this preface, Professor Dasgupta Wright, in this connection, the question obviously comes immediately as to what should be the name of the proposed new state. It has to be it has to be found at all in the context, the poetic, and at the same time, the beautiful scenic name Meghalaya was suggested by Professor S. P. Chatterjee, came out immediately handy in 1972 when the state was named. So it is another big contribution of Professor Chatterjee to give the name. Now we consider the Northeast situation. The Meghalaya is basically English-speaking Christian population. There a Sanskrit name was given and that was accepted. On the other hand, you see Nagaland. Again, it is a Christian dominating place. Again, in Northeast. But like England, Holland, name was given Nagaland, not Naga Pradesh or some other local version like Tamil Nadu type. But an English name was given for the same region. So what I'm trying to say that his suggestions were so much acceptable for the country. Next, please. <coughs> this is a ma another major contribution. is a World Atlas of Agriculture. He was editor of the Asian volume. There are several volumes. And India portion he wrote. Friends, I would like to tell you that if you can lay your hand in this atlas, the India portion written by him, one of the best written version of geography of India in this volume. So please go through it. Still, it is very important. Still, still valid. A very gives a very detailed thing. The, the, the physiography part of Gazetteer of India, published in, if I remember correctly, 19 around 1960. First chapter was written by him. Again, very comprehensive account of the physical geography of the country. When I used to go to book fair in Calcutta, the geographer used to come and ask me that whether there is something more written on the physical geography of the country other than this. And if you see, if you compare the recent, or not recent, lately, all the write-ups on Indian physiography, you will find reflection of this uh, volume written by Professor S. P. Chatterjee. It is also published in the Physiographic Series of National Letters of India, 
प्लेट नंबर टू टू सेवन नेक्स्ट दिस इज ए लास्ट पब्लिकेशन ही गेव मी अन कॉपी बिकॉज आई वॉज वेरी क्लोजली वर्किंग विथ हिम ड्यूरिंग इज लास्ट डेज एंड स्टेज दैट प्रेजेंट टू माई स्टीम्ड कोलीग डॉक्टर पी नाग ऑफ नेशनल थीमेटिंग ऑर्गेनाइजन ट्वेंटी जुलाई नाइनटीन एटी सिक्स दिस वॉल्यूम आई कैरिड विथ मी वेन आई वेंट टू इंग्लैंड एंड प्रोफेसर बिहाफ आई प्रेजेंटेड टू लॉट ऑफ पीपल इन लंडन एंड एल्सवेयर बिकॉज यू वॉन्टेड टू डू सो नेक्स्ट ही वॉज इंस्ट्रूमेंटल इन स्टेब्लिशिंग दी जोग्राफिक सोसाइटी ऑफ इंडिया नाइनटीन थर्टी थ्री ऑनवर्ड्स रेगुलरली कंट्रीब्यूटिंग टू दी जोग्राफिक रिव्यू ऑफ इंडिया जर्नल एंड ऑल्सो दी ऑब्जर्वर दी स्टूडेंट जर्नल एंड वॉट ऑफ गुड आर्टिकल्स आर देयर इन ऑब्जर्वर एज वेल दो वी मे थिंक दैट इज फॉर स्टूडेंट बट वॉट ऑफ डेप्थ इज देयर सो इफ यू वॉन्ट टू अंडरस्टैंड प्रोफेसर चैटर्ज कंट्रीब्यूशन अपार्ट फ्रॉम द जोग्राफिक रिव्यू ऑब्जर्वर वे ऑल्सो बी कंसल्टेड नेक्स्ट दिस इज वेयर द जोग्राफिक सोसाइटी वॉज फर्स्ट स्टेब्लिश्ड इन द बेकर्स लेबोरेटरी see the this is the baker's lab where the geographical society was established this is a map of presidency college so many awards he got there are several others also i remember the murchison grant was when i was given a award commonwealth award from uh, royal geographical society i went there and i could see on the list on the wall that his name was there and second la last but one the appreciation by igu and igc during the international geographical congress in tokyo in 1980 He was honorary fellow of INCRA, honorary fellow of Chinese Association, honorary member of Japanese, honorary member of American Geographical Society, etc. Can you help me, somebody? Hello. Battery is running out. Yeah. his contribution to international geography and cartography has been very important the most important one that he was president of the international geographical union and also president of the organizing committee of 21st international geographical congress held in delhi in 1968 and during the same time the international cartographic association also had its annual conference uh, not annual conference the four years conference it was one of the last time when igu and ica both had a joint congress and professor chatterjee was meant organized both the thing together which is very rare this is how the press has taken the coverage during that time you can see professor tukna sen here the appreciation by igu appreciation by the japanese geographer the american geographical society awarded him the honorary fellow of agc ags chinese academy chinese means taiwan chinese they also recognized him and he was also awarded padma bhushan in 1985 one of the highest civilian award in the country nevertheless he was not happy as i mentioned with whatever he did bengal in maps the national atlas planning atlas 
were there, but his approach was different. The French National Atlas model of bringing National Atlas of a country for the first time with German maps, he considered that on the lines of socialist country, he wanted to establish Institute of Geography. So he mixed up different models in different countries and wanted to put forward the case of India establishing either Research Institute of Geography or Institute of Geography. So he was also influenced by the Soviet geographers, Polish geographers, and also used their models where the primary activity was to do geographical research and cartography was a byproduct of that research. Unfortunately, what we are having in NATMO is the primary activity is to produce map and whatever geographical conclusion we can bring out, we accept it. It's the other way, which he didn't want it. So there is a clear distinction between what he wanted and what is actually being done. His solution was that European model, East European model, West European model, both put together, and there should be an Institute of Geography. He was also interested that there should be a big establishment for doing surveys, collecting data on the lines of the geological survey. So his, he produced, he had several proposals. Na the names are as follows, the National Institute of Geography, Research Institute of Geography, Institute of Art Science, Research Association for Indian Geographers. So give several names during several course of time and no, nothing was accepted. He still continuing, continued to produce his research work, land use survey, land utilization survey of India, national atlas, etc. He continued that. He wanted a strong cartographic department with standard map making. And national atlas was, was doing certain, expected to do certain things in this regard. Just before my joining, Mayor General Cheetham was brought in. He was from the Ordnance Survey in Great Britain to study NATMO and Survey of India and suggest what is to be done. What he says, till the coming of appropriate or an opportunate moment, as it was then felt, it would involve a considerable widening scope of National Atlas organization. So he thought that what Professor Chatterjee is asking is too much. And in a way, he didn't agree to what Professor Chatterjee said. There were geographers also in this. They didn't support Professor Chatterjee in establishing the institute. Unfortunately, these geographers, they used to come for meetings in National Atlas Organization. They used to stay in Professor Chatterjee's house, go with him in the same car. But in the meeting, they used to oppose Professor Chatterjee. It is there in the minutes, printed minutes. This was the fate of his initiatives. George Kurian report was there, published 76, 1976. And then only development was that thematic mapping was added. So it was National Atlas and thematic mapping organization. This was the only development which took place. 78, and since then we know as NETMO. His dream was different. match with the Professor Chatterjee dream, he wanted to establish an institute of geography where the results were to be brought out in cartographic form, similar to Bengalian maps or Damodar Valley Atlas. Now geographical researches are only done when it is required for thematic cartography. 
not exactly what Professor Chatterjee wanted. He kept on doing his work, geological mapping, other nature studies, etc. It was Professor Chatterjee who brought geophysical cartography and thematic cartography into limelight. This is Sitanshu Mukherjee. The person who was not able to identify in that photograph was Sitanshu Mukherjee. And it was the result of his effort and his status of cartography was raised. His method of research in, the field, in this field consisting of intensive collection of primary data and his topical classification and quantitative analysis, etc. So his basically like Dudley Stamp's work, primary data collection and preparation of map. And he wanted his department, National Atlas, to be well equipped with the latest things, latest instruments. These are the few examples of the intensive work carried out. This two million map giving you the land capability of the whole country. By then, aerial photography was there and the uh, remote sensing data, initially 80 meter resolution was available. So this is the category he basically identified. Transport tourism map of the whole country in 16 sheet, very detailed mapping was carried out by him. Land use again, one is to one million, very detailed mapping was carried out. And closest to what he wanted, the Dudley Stamps approach, this was carried out by him. The categories you can see, the Navadavali Atlas, this person who would like to see more, they can go through the, the libraries available. I won't go in details. His role in IU, I have already mentioned. It was historical that first time an International Geographical Congress was held in Asia under, under his guardianship. Lately, he became spiritual also. And geography and culture, he gave two very important lectures in Sai Baba Ashram. We have published those uh, lectures in Life and Work of Professor S. P. Chatterjee, Volume 2, published by National Atlas and Thematic Mapping Organization. He was also interested in digital part. Digital things were just getting started. But we tried to develop this initiative in NATMO and Golden Map Service was established, carrying out detailed field work and put, putting the data on the web with, with on-web inquiry as well. The example you can see here, detail mapping of part of Calcutta. Now, why Professor Chatterjee should be remembered? Number one, to promote cartography in India from a different route, that is from geography, against a very strong presence of Survey of India. He had to really fight with Survey of India in order to promote that type of cartography in the country, a major contribution. Second, for establishing National Atlas Organization, NATMO later, and thereby introducing professionalism in geography. Before that, professionalism was not there in geography. The second contribution. Third, as I mentioned, to name the plateau northeastern India as Meghalaya. A lot of people have come from Meghalaya as well. Fourth is the realization of India. This detailed study dividing the region of country which has been ignored by geographers. He has made major contribution in that. And in 
say the physical map or if you see the satellite atlas of india this physiographic fifth order physiographic regions have been named there so that is a major contribution in realization of india and it started from meghalaya see this is drawn by him it is in his own handwriting i superimposed his draft map on a printed map and these are the regions which he identified the basic research i recently brought out a book on geography of india at the back side of that book this map is printed as well further professor robert link the secretary general of icia mentioned all atlases need to be structured all atlas needs information selected and processed in order to be in line with the narrative all resulting maps and files should be generalized and possible to perform main atlas function require creation of adequate functionality this is what professor chatterjee did and was acknowledged by the international cartographic association further he said but these digital atlas product will be increasingly used in an isolated viewing or learning situation now more than we should uh, atlas user by providing maps commentaries such as has been developed by and extended by professor chatterjee see now what is happening you are all having departments gis remote sensing keep on talking but where is the narrative each map produced by professor chatterjee had a narrative had a story had a description now we do something produce very flashy map and there is no interpretation of that but he did and was been appreciated by iju and ica his last home you can see in sevak badda street where he resides i used to go quite often is off uh, uh, hazra road in baliganj area i had a this is the material i used for this presentation including professor das gupta's sp das gupta's feedback to me during that time when he was alive finally i had a very i worked very closely during last days apart from helping him bringing out the books professor chaturji told me that geography of india has to be written again till his time he was alive three chapters were written and he approved that but by then he died then i completed the whole book and he wanted a book very handy useful for the students it should not be a bulky one normally geography of india are very bulky books handy one and should give the give the gist of everything so I, that book was produced published by concept in 1992 the last line says that about me and it is up to you to analyze whether i i did something to his expectation or not he expected a lot of things from me and i tried to do my best but you have to analyze whether i fulfilled his dream or not i think the last one thank you for your attention friends i try to cover whatever possible but from the 13 list few i could mention there are other still gaps there All, already 90 slides were over so i thought i have to stop somewhere so i stopped here in future if i get chance i will explain to his other dimensions as well thank you very much thank you for inviting me thank you for the patience hearing and i must appreciate i have been in several conferences the uh, internal quality assessment cell has i have never seen been involved in organizing a conference like this their role has been different but here i find their role is more vibrating vibrant to organize a conference 
along with the geography department. I thank the principal, I thank the IQC cell, I thank the geography department, I thank everybody who is connected with it. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir, for this uh, insightful deliberation. Uh, before we go for the lunch break, I would like to uh, inform you that uh, scientific model exhibition stalls have been installed at our college ground. I would request you to visit the stalls uh, at your own leisure. Uh, now it's already 2 p.m. It's already 2 p.m. Uh, it's time for having lunch together. I would like to inform you that uh, our lunch break is for 30 minutes. Uh, and it will be a great pleasure to have you return to this room by 2.30 p.m. So please uh, enjoy your meal. Thank you. Respected speakers, honorable delegates, faculty members, and dear fellow participants, we are privileged to present to you a distinguished panel of experts who will be sharing their profound insights in the field of geography and related disciplines. This esteemed group of speakers will enlighten us on a range of topics that are both pertinent and timely. The exchange of knowledge and ideas that will take place during this session promises to be invaluable for all of us. Allow me to introduce the coordinator of this session, Professor Jayant K. Rautre, Professor Emeritus at the Asian Institute of Technology, Bangkok, Thailand. Sir will introduce the panelists of this session. Over to you, sir. I'll finish it. This is okay. Hello, everybody. May I have your attention, please? Now we'll have a plenary session. We have uh, five panelists. Professor S.K. De, he is from Nehu, and also president of the International Association of Geomorphologists. And I uh, request him also to come to the uh, dais. And Professor 
सुनंद बंदोपाध्याय डिस्टिंगुई स्कॉलर फ्रॉम द डिपार्टमेंट ऑफ ज्योग्राफी एट द यूनिवर्सिटी ऑफ कलकत्ता एंड आई आल्सो रिक्वेस्ट हर टू बी हियर देन प्रोफेसर आशीष पाल ही इज फ्रॉम डिपार्टमेंट ऑफ ज्योग्राफी विद्यासागर यूनिवर्सिटी ही विल थ्रो लाइट ऑन एडवांसमेंट इन कोस्टल स्टडीज ही इज आल्सो रिक्वेस्टेड टू कम हियर एंड प्रोफेसर नारायण चंद्र जना ये लुमिनरी फ्रॉम द डिपार्टमेंट ऑफ ज्योग्राफी इन Roy, a distinguished speaker, will share his expertise and assessment of the flood susceptibility mapping and hydrological modeling, and uh, he his insights into the integration of machine learning and GIS, how it helps uh, in predictive and decision making framework. So I request Professor De, Professor Bandupadhyay, Professor Paul. Professor Jana and Professor Roy to come and take chairs here, and we'll start our plenary discussion soon. One more. topics and at the end of their uh, say uh, presentation i think we will take some few questions from the audience and then we can discuss so you will start yeah. Please switch on the lights. Switch off the lights. Respected uh, chairperson. My dear co-speakers, luminaries sitting in front of the dais, participants, students and scholars, I am thankful to the organizing committee for giving me the chance. Say, the time was allotted for 15 minutes, but now we have come to know the 10 minutes. Anyway, very quickly, I shall try to go to the recent one. Please switch on these slides.
Please go back to the first slide. Okay. I will go through very quickly. There are different phases of geomorphic evolution. Uh, what happened? Uh, it has gone last. What happened? Why it is going last? Say this emergence of geomorphology from the historical science of geomor geology. Initially, geomorphology did not have. Can you please silent in the backside? This is for you only, not for us. See, it was initiated from geology. In textbook, it is written that Maggie and Powell initiated the term geomorphology, but it is not correct. Norman, in German language, he initiated the term geomorphology in 1856. And Maggie and Powell used the terms in 1886 in International Geological Congress. But they have used the term geomorphic geology. See, first one, this is Gilbert. He was an engineer. But since he was an engineer, he did not have any proper knowledge on geomorphology. That's why he could not popularize process geomorphology. But after that, I'll quickly go. But after that, W.M. Davis, the first phase has come in the field. You know, many of the geomorphologists, they consider that Davis initiated geomorphology and given the first theory on geomorphic evolution. But the recent books, they say that geomorph this any type of evolutionary geomorphology Davis could not give. He has taken three concepts from three places. One is time scale he had taken from the, this uh, origin of life from Charles Darwin. He has taken process from G.K. Gilbert and he has taken structure from this uh, Lil, then uh, principles of geology, all these books. But he had tried to amalgamate all these concepts and tried to formulate the cycle of erosion. Now very quickly I will go. <coughs> Davis tried to show that it was a regional concept. This is not my, this proper presentation here because I will speak more on the recent trends. After that, this Walter Peng came in the field. And I will show one slide. Peng is saying on W.M. Davis that it does not in include the endogenetic processes. Firstly, Davis worked on a regional basis in the northern part of America from where he used to belong. So he did not try to this apply his theory throughout the world. He had very less amount of field experience. But he also did not include the endogenetic processes in his theory. Then once denudation process began, block remains at rest. He told that, that uh, this, uh, this uh, emergence and successive processes operate together, it is not right. Then a special case as a general rule, as I told you, Now, I, what I wanted to show, you know, this Walter Peng's father name was Albert Peng. W.M. Davis came from United States to Germany to learn German language, in which this Albert Peng was 
the, was, was a professor of that university. And when he got in touch of W.M. Davis, he had sent the publication of Walter Peng to W.M. Davis. But after going through this literature, Davis commented on Peng that it is pleasant to news that your son Walter is established as professor in Leipzig. And after that, I have written asking him to specify the details he finds in accepting the cycle theory. And he commented that Peng could not understand anything about cycle theory. Although Peng proposed a new theory, but when it was sent to W.M. Davis to translate in English, then W.M. Davis incorporated his opinion in his theory. So that is why the cyclic concept after that, the cell seeking you know very well, it had come to field and this could not survive for a long time. That is why the title is given the demise of the circle of, cycle of erosion. After the publication of two books, one book was written by this is physically based model, next step came. One is R.A. Bagnold. He had written the book, The Physics of Blown Sand and Desert Dunes in 1941. And after that, another book was written by this Houghton. This is Houghton, who was a hydrologist, and he tried to formulate a deterministic model channel initiation and drainage network. After the publication of these two books, the cyclic concept had gone away and people have come to utilize more physically based model in geomorphology. Then, <coughs> third phase, <coughs> this is the emergence of process geomorphology, what Gilbert promised initially, and this was a difficult task. It had come to dynamic basis of geomorphology, Ian Streller. Nowadays, you get the book written by Ian Streller, and his son also was Ian Streller. They were the professor in the same university. They had written this dynamic basis of geomorphology. After that, this book came. This dynamic equilibrium theory was proposed by J.T. Hack. Then after that, Scheidegger, just few years back, he has left all of us. But he was a proponent of the theoretical geomorphology. So geomorphology gradually improving from cyclic concept to physically based models two other this networking model and this fourth phase. Now quantitative modeling and experimentation and disequilibrium came in the field. After the second world war, many, con many quantification in different subjects started including geography and geomorphology and it was initiated although in Europe but after that America accepted and they were the most proponents. Now I will go quickly with the slides, I will come to this contemporary phase. So, after this quantification, the last phase has come. I'll go quickly to disequilibrium has come, experimentation has come. Now, this contemporary geomorphology, which is the major concern, recent trends in geomorphology, why this has come? Number one, since 1990s, geomorphology has been influenced strongly by several trends. An increasing concern with complexity and non-linear dynamics. If we consider landslide events, it's a non-linear phenomena, it's not a linear phenomena, it has several factors in it. Number two, rapid advances is measurement technology with the initiation of computer as well as satellite imageries and GIS technology. Then this perfection in geomorphological research has enhanced increasing computational and information processing capabilities. After that, enhanced collaboration with other disciplines. Now we are more dependent on chemistry, physics, biology, and all these aspects, all these subjects. Then interest in philosophical issues that uh, we try to analyze cause-effect relationship, impact, all these things. Concern about practical aspect, human impacts, because of, during this Holocene period, human impacts on geomorphology has increased in a greater extent. And after 1870s, the nature of change in the atmosphere due to human activities, in the, in the nature in, due to human activities has been more. So this is the initiation of anthropogenic geomorphology. And lastly, a renewed focus on landform development, 
our geological time scale with the initiation of different types of dating techniques we are considering this type of this uh, time scale phenomena in geomorphology and geology now with these changes different branches in geomorphology have initiated climatic geomorphology geomorphic sensitivity biogeography tectonic geomorphology terrestrial geomorphology archaeo geomorphology geomorpho sites geo heritage sites then environmental geomorphology anthropogenic geomorphology river health then connectivity in geomorphology and virtual geomorphology so all these sub branches in geomorphology have come up now since i deal mainly with this environmental geomorphology river health and virtual geomorphology so i will give a glimpse from china where i used to go for different types of so lastly there is another branch which is called dangshia geomorphology so environmental geomorphology river health and dangshia i am directly involved i will give a glimpse on gangshia geomorphology what is that now see as i belong to the international association of geomorphology many of the sub branches have come through our working groups we support young stars young geomorphologists we support working groups if you have a new concept you can propose it after doing 4 years or 8 years this work if you can emerge with some of the publications then this is included in the new branch in geomorphology so till today we have given 35 working groups and from which many of the subjects now it is established as a sub branch in geomorphology for example you see this dangshia geomorphology 21 it is a long pending this issue and dangshia geomorphology is a part of environmental geomorphology very briefly i will say there are two aspects in environmental geomorphology one is geomorphological resource and another is geomorphological hazard when we are collecting geomorphological resource or using geomorphological resource unscientifically then nature it tries to balance itself and it creates different types of hazards so the magnitude and frequency of hazards are increasing due to human intervention to depend more on this geomorphological resources so here you see two aspects geomorphological resources and geomorphological hazards now we have geomorphological raw materials when it is valuable it is forming geomorphological asset when this geomorphological assets are used by us then it is called geomorphological resources there are many examples if you see a sabimala and river belt many stones are deposited on the river belt it is raw material if it is valuable of course it is valuable this building is constructed with those materials so then it is geomorphological asset and when you are using it then it is geomorphological resource so we have landforms in one side another side social organization when the two mixing then it forming geomorphological resource and this geomorphological resource they have the social organization three four important components economics culture politics and tourism so now this dangshia landform i will come here this dangshia landform what is this it refers to the various landscape found in the southeast southwest and northwest in china since 2015 we have been going there six of us they are inviting one is the unesco this geo heritage site director ulfram gang me professor lee from korea who is the deputy director of dangshia geomorpho sites in this asian countries then another is from milika from slovakia and two from poland piotr migon and philip so six of us are every, every almost alternate year we used to go there our duty was to propose something to 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 sustain this dear jangshia landforms this is a very high this impact tourism site it has aesthetic value it has scientific value academic value as well as economic value now i will show this is dangshia landform this sediment deposits are very old i will come to the geology part this beautiful laminated marks almost parallel to each other from top to bottom of the whole area 
This is very old sedimentation during this Cretaceous period I will come. It was covered with lowest deposit during post Pleistocene havoc. The lowest deposit have been eroded away and during every monsoon period this water when it is flowing it is forming this laminar marks. So this is Dankshire landform and these marks are also present in cliff, cliff areas. Now in the side areas there are cliffs and they are facing different types of landslide events as well as people are walking on the surface which is very okay I'll do which is very very this loose and very soon if the people will go on this landform it will very easily this uh, eroded now this laminated marks have entered the river valley, this water is flowing down the river and this lamination marks are formed which is formed a beautiful topography. This complex geology you know, we can find formed in lower Cretaceous period covered with water in a deposit, eroded the cover mass and exposed as paleo landform, further carved out by wind and water to form this beautiful topography. So this is a very important geomorphological area and this is you see Dengshia landform in China. This is taken from Shangxi province when we were there in 2015 and 2019. So this Dengshia landform they are trying to popularize throughout the world. Say climate and hydrological characteristics every year this laminar marks due to the flow of water it forms and the, from that part the, this part it is eroded. So if we don't take care Academic value, of course, it has economic value. We can promote this geotourism site, not only in this Dangshia site, this uh, Longju, it is very close to Shangxi province, but also throughout the whole northern Shangxi province. Now, <clears throat> our duty, six of us, they have assigned two engineers to us to propose the remedial measures for their sustainability. So we have proposed several techniques the surrounding area should be covered with vegetation up to 150 meters the area should be covered with vegetation and there should be proper track when the, where the people will move number two to arrange for a safety demonstrative before entering to the site in order to save the area from anthropogenic degradation then with us what happened ah Wooden pavement should be, should be constructed where this people cannot walk over the surface and the surface can be sustained. This was our proposal. Alternate geomorphological sites should be this, uh, explored to divert the flow of the tourist. And lastly, this, is, this was our proposal, although this is a shallow landslide, not a deep-seated landslide. Six and two of us sit together and after that we have proposed this one in 2015. They have implemented in 2018 and when we went there in 2019 we have seen that the whole slope is stabilized with proper drainage network and this low cost bioengineering along with civil engineering techniques to, pro to check these landslides. So with this they have given us this honor this uh, to distinguished expert in Shangxi Institute of Geological Survey Almost they invite us regularly, but we cannot go regularly. And after that, this is Peng Hua who has popularized this, this uh, Dengshia landform, although Dengshia landform initiated in 1926. But since 1980s, he has been working on it and he has popularized throughout this world. So this is a new branch in geomorphology as a geotourism site or geo, geo, park, geo park area. So with this, I thank you very much. If any question, we'll, uh, we'll reply after this session. So thank you. And we'll take up uh, the questions at the end of all those presentations. Please keep your questions uh, ready, and we'll take it up at the end. So now I request Professor Bandhupadhyay to make his presentation. Thank you. From Dangshia, we would... Hello, everybody, first. 
Then from Bangshia, we would we will travel to Shundarbon now, waiting for the slides. नाम से पढ़ा चुके हैं। रामपुरान बोले, बाहर ही तो आ चुके हैं। अजीब है, कोई ये देख सकता है? देखिए आज से ना नगी तो आता है, एक्सेस को चुके तो। ना ना, वो रख खुलूक ना। पेन ड्राइव ड्राइव तो खड़ा होना तो उठा चुके हैं ना तुम्हें एक्सेस को चुके ना उठा? Okay, we travel to the area which is uh, enclosed in that yellow box. Yeah, you, you, what you see here where the extent of the Shundabon mangroves. I don't have to explain Shundabon mangroves to you who are basically from West Bengal. A at the time uh, when it was first mapped in 1779, then if we, after that two things happened simultaneously, one is that all these channels got blocked, you know, they got detached from the main river. So, this delta, what you see here, this delta did not, you know, it started to not to receive any sedimentation which he used to receive before that. And also, there were gradual deforestation. Okay, as you can see, this is the Sundarbon now. And first, just to have an idea of that, we would travel to this region here in the Bangladeshi part of it. Okay. Look at that place within the yellow circle. And here you find an interface of the nature and the anthropogenically modified landscape. Again, so you have humans on the upper side and all the wild animals on the lower side as well as the mangroves. Okay. Then again, if you just uh, zoom on that, you would see that the internal side, the, you know, the human atomic landscape is completely controlled by log gates and other things. So while we have two high tides and two low tides every day in the natural side, in the anthropogenically modified side, it's completely controlled by the operation of log gates. Okay. That brings us to this, the sea level and land level and the, what will be the face of the Shundaman reclamations. What we see here is a tide gauge. You can see this tide gauge. This is a Diamond Herbert in the low tide. 
and if you come to the same place in the high tide you will get everything is covered okay and these things are recorded these things are recorded through automatic tide gauges like the these two photographs what you can see and also manually as you can see in the photographs two photographs below and they are recorded every hour in logs like this or they are also recorded in the automatic gauges in uh, 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 graphs like this. You can understand the upper crests are the high water and the lower crests in the troughs are the low water representing. Okay, now these sort of diagrams, we have two high tides and two low tides every day. And so that means 365 high tides and low tides. I mean 365 into two high tide and into two low tides and you average that out if you know all high tides and all low tides 365 into four then you have a, a number that is the mean sea level for that particular year and if you go on projecting that numbers for a number of years at least some 30 to 40 to 60 years you have sea level trend so you can get from the tide gauges you can get the sea level of one place and when you plot those sea level geographically you have this okay so different sea gauges around the Sundarbon the forests are hatched area and forests and the reclaimed areas are hatched you have these sort of diagrams and it shows that as you go north the sea level is actually rising and I would say uh, if you just uh, you know the subtract the outliers the sea level at Sundarbon is rising from 3 to 4 millimeter per year and that is rising as you go up the rate of rise is more and in some other papers which were you know published simultaneously we also find the same sort of rate as you go north the sea level rate of the rise is also increasing and also they are increasing towards the west sorry towards the east as you can see here not much time to explain you will have to take my word for it okay and even if you take satellite altimetry we also see the same sort of thing i told you between three to four so you can uh, find out the 3.89 millimeter per year is the rate of sea level rise just outside the shundarbon mangroves right now now comes a very important point what is mean sea level we actually know that of course this is the mean sea level you know uh, indicated by this red line that is between the high tide and low tide but look at this photograph here what do you see here you see high tide not mean sea level okay this is the high tide level and what it also shows is this from the top of the embankment the water surface is just half a meter below that means if a cyclone comes at this time the entire water would go and invade the low-lying areas please remember our earlier slides which are separated so this is higher than this so if there is no embankment then the entire high tide will flood the low-lying areas and that precisely what happens during the cyclones okay so I have this taken from the internet see there are no clouds no operation of rainfall nothing but the embankments are being overtopped. okay now what is the solution what is the solution for that do we just put go on increasing the height of the embankment like this or there is something well very quickly i would uh, you know explain you this see here are three settlements or i would say stations hiron point mongla and kulna at 0 78 and 122 kilometers so we have here this is the place where Huron Point is located this is the place where uh, Mongla is located and here somewhere here is Khulna is located now see interestingly while the mean sea level is the rate of mean sea level rise is decreasing the rate of mean high water level is increasing that means the tidal range is also increasing so so this is a so that means in this diagram this particular high water level is increasing so this is also called the effective sea level okay that means it is not the mean sea level on which we should concentrate it should be the high sea level okay now very quickly i will go through this 
these are the you know this is i will just come to this uh, this is from the coastal dam of 2019 uh, you know published by the climate coastal center dot org you can find that go to their website and see they predict that all these areas of shundama would be underwater in 2050 there is one slide from the worldwide fund for nature you see what they suggest they suggest that all you should uh, you know, abandon all these areas. If they are unfit for human habitation. In very soon, it will be because they will all underwater because of the rising sea level. And you will have to put all these uh, persons in multi-storied houses, which are I have circled like that. Now, the question is: Is that situation so bleak? There is some other thing. So that is the sea level. Now, what about the land level? See, this is a pristine forest, natural forest. Okay, Shundaban mangroves, and see. On the left, you have the thing in the low tide, the place, and on the right, we have a high tide. Now, high tide yields silt, okay. When the high tide is there and standing, they would precipitate silt, and that would increase the level of the land. Very quickly, we can go through one thing. See, here, on the upper left, you have reclaimed, the area reclaimed in 20, 1920s, here they reclaimed in 1940s, and here they reclaimed in 1980s. And you see, so, the upper left reclaimed first and the lower right left they have reclaimed the uh, at 1980s and these places are not reclaimed at all now we have purchased what is called the coastal you know this digital terrain model not the elevation model that shows the land surface stripping the vegetation they don't see the top of the trees but the actual land you see very interesting thing the highest areas are where there are forest and then then this 1980s these were uh, reclaimed you know in the in this was the latest phase of reclamation which we have seen and that is the earliest phase of reclamation what you have seen so that is the lowest part and higher part highest part in the reclaimed areas and if you take it all together the highest part in the entire area are the places where there are forests because you have embankments when you remove the embankments if there are no embankments there are there will be a lot of uh, siltation but when you put the embankment, you are stopping the siltation. The earlier you put, the lower the area becomes. Okay. And see, how can you address that? I will be brief, sir. Another a few slides. Okay. I will take an example from very close to home. This is the tidal river, Hugli. And here is a brick clean, you know, Jakewal Eid Bhata. Can I speak in Bengali? I don't know. Is there any person who cannot understand Bengali? You can't. Oh, yes. Like. So now you see what I say. Here is a brick clean, okay, over there. And here is a sedimentation pond. What is the role of that? It's simply an excavated area. From there you see, here is a connected channel, connecting channel from the Hubli. During the monsoons, they open the channel. So you have a lot of sedimentation here, all the time, all the monsoons. What I will go in, what I will go out. After the monsoons, this is closed. These connecting channels are closed. And then you see what it yields. Okay. See, rich harvest of silt. All these silts, almost a meter thick, were deposited during the monsoons. Okay. So, if we open the reclaimed regions, or the depressed areas to tidal spill they will raise the level of the land and this has indeed been seen in many works here and also in this work by Orbeck et al this is folder 32 in Bangladesh the first slide on the upper left the diagram shows the region before the Isla cyclone you can see here it is during the Isla cyclone and all these embankments are breached and this after the Isla cyclone this group from the Vandenberg University, they had simply penetrated a lot of boreholes. And if you take a single borehole, you will find this is the pre isla surface before the isla, you know, the major storm, which took place in 2009. And then this entire sequence of 40 centimeters, 40 centimeters of sediments were deposited at the time when it was open to tidal spill before the embankments were repaired. So that raised the level of her land, an unprecedented rate of 40 centimeters divided by three years. Okay. Okay. 
now see with it you, you also you can see that uh, all the uh, the this tidal phase i saw that the tide is climbing up fast a tide is going down slow that means the sediment it is bringing in cannot be taken back right it cannot be taken back so we have lot of sedimentation in the estuary and not only that the sedimentation is increasing as we go up as we go inside the estuary not only the asymmetry also the tidal range it is also going up so that brings us to the fact that there are lot of accretion in the upper part and that is a positive signal of course that is a real positive signal because although we have very high population pressure some active sedimentation is taking place in many places you are you can see here this is this, this is the one the last slide so which was all these plates in one wilderness in the shundaban region they are all covered with silt so while the sea level is rising the land level is also rising the question is whether this land level can beat the rate of the sea level rise okay thank you so thank you very much i think uh, we will take up some issue at the end and now i request professor paul <coughs> चेंज करो चेंज करो नेक्स्ट प्रेजेंटेशन respected chairperson my co speakers and also the ladies and gentlemen i start my presentation yes so <clears throat> my topic of discussion is the advancement in the coastal studies and overview and guideline recently we are exploring the coastal geomorpho sites in andaman particularly in the limestone dominated islands of baratang island richis archipelago havelock island little andaman and neel islands so whatever we have seen in the inner parts of the islands there are the different types of the pseudo coastal uh, karstic features and the fluvio karstic features but at the shore platforms we are getting the phytoclastic landforms <coughs> if we just go through the the different phases of the advancement of the coastal studies in the abroad and also in our own country there you can see that there are six stages of the advancement of the coastal studies took place in our country and in the world also and every time the thrust areas of the coastal studies have been changed and materials and methods of the study also improved uh, like the other sub disciplines of the physical geography coastal studies have advanced over the last century and even in the 18th century also with the with the advance of the at uh, the coastal Uh, coral morphology by darwin and dana in 1862 and then in 1919 first the coastal processes are studied by johnson and then fairbridge and nordstrom and many others actually studied on the coastal processes coastal geomorphology coastal geology and uh, uh, and particularly the scheme of the coastal classifications but presently the entire theme of the coastal research have been changed to the uh, environmental geomorphology climate change impacts and the ocean dynamics if i just consider two different studies at the current century here you can see that one is the enso influence on the bay of bengal cyclogenesis 
confined to the low latitudes. This study actually made by the Shinto Ruse and its group. And in that study, they have predicted that the interannual variability of the post monsoonal Bay of Bengal low latitude cyclones and their teleconnections with the El Nino, Southern Oscillation and Indian Ocean Dipole. So Indian Ocean Dipole positive and negative effects and then the ENSO cycles are actually responsible as a driving forces in the ocean dynamics at present because our Bay of Bengal and the Arabian Sea are the very enclosed seas. So in that area, we have seen that, that the present day, present day shoreline dynamics and the shoreline morphological positions have been changed only because of the three major factors. One is the ENSO cycle and then Indian Ocean dipole systems and then ocean dynamics and the fourth significant feature is that anthropogenic pressure where we have seen that how the human controlled uh, river discharges which are taking place into the coastal zones and that's why the, the dynamics of the shore lines at the local scale are changing dramatically. So the, this group of the study you can see that they have studied in the global scale, in the regional scale and in the local scale how the driving forces are acting in the coastal dynamics. Coastal zones are very fragile and complex dynamical systems that are increasingly under threat from the combined effect of the anthropogenic pressures and climate change. Then the interannual variation that is taking place actually at present in the enclosed seas of the Bay of Bengal where we are working at the regional scale and the local scale, we have seen that the ocean dynamics and the sea level rise uh, at the same time the human controlled river discharges are mainly responsible. And the climate change impacts we have seen because after 1990, the thrust areas of the coastal studies have been shifted to the hazard as a geomorphic process in the coastal area. So many coastal geomorphologists were actually connected with the studies on the assessments of the hazards, the disasters, risks, coastal hazard, coastal vulnerability assessment, and resiliencies of the coastal areas. Then the coastal management and coastal environmental geomorphology came and at present with the uh, advancement of the technology like the machine learning tools and the, uh, and the artificial intelligence and the metadata analysis, a group of the organized data set which provides the different types of the information, then remote sensing and modeling techniques, actually it has been advanced to the climate change impacts on the coastal area. So a new framework for the understanding and predicting climate induced coastal hazards to be considered in the <coughs> next decades. So this is the guidelines that what can we do? First of all, the climate induced hazards and vulnerability assessment are needed for the uh, most vulnerable tracts of the coastal areas. Second one, the coastal resilient environment, we have uh, to explore the adaptation techniques, then climate resilient amendments are needed, soft engineering techniques in coastal Protection measures also needed for the low-lying tracks like Sundarban area and in the Gujarat coast area and also in some parts of the Odisha coast. Attempt also needed to reduce the anthropogenic pressures in the coastal zones. Actually, relocation of the engineering structures are not possible because of the uh, population pressure in the coastal area. If you just consider the coastal zones of our Midapur littoral tract, there we have seen that every two kilometers interval, the population pressure is gradually increasing at 2 to 4 kilometers, 600 persons are living per square kilometer, but from the 6 to 8 kilometers, there are 1,400 persons are living per square kilometer. So gradually, the population, because of the population pressure, the relocation of the engineering structures is not possible at present. Then environmental regulations, already the CRJ maps are prepared, and uh, also uh, many regulations for the different coastal zones are already uh, uh, already done by the Minister of Environment and Forest, then resettlement, but there is no resettlement policy for the climate refugee. We have no vision plan for the climate refugee, and rehabilitation policy, and uh, conservations of the marine and the freshwater environments while using them in a sustainable way to develop the economic growth and produce energy and food resources. So we need the green engineering solution in the coastal habitat restoration strategies. So uh, particularly the habitat restoration by afforestation of the mangroves in the Sundarban are going on very rapidly. Also, mangrove afforestation program uh, actually initiated in 2006 by the forest department from Kaveri Delta. 
So <coughs> now in our uh, West Bengal parts of the Indian Sundarban, there the mangrove appreciation program is going on. And then seas, oceans and fisheries are probably among the most challenging natural resource systems to govern at present. So naturally, we have to decide on the, uh, decide on the plastic free environment intensifying conservation efforts. Ocean system is affected by the multiple stressors, so that should be studied. And ocean ecosystem resilience, also we have to think. So I have identified, and this, this, is, this, is, this is the work by the Huizar and the Varniman in 2021. Here you can see that uh, just using the global uh, data, the high resolution global data, uh, they have classified the entire GBM delta on the basis of the elevation and just two minutes. And then <coughs> if you just add the impact of the relative sea level rise of one meter on that area, then how many persons will be displaced in the near future? So already they have thought about this, but uh, we are not thinking and we have no vision plan, no vision plan for the climate refugee in this area. So I have identified some climate induced coastal hazards for the case of the Indian Sundarban. And uh, here we have observed that how the recurrence, mean recurrence time and the mean relaxation time are actually gradually decreasing. And that's why the hammering effects of the cyclones are actually occurring in our Sundarban coastal tract. Since 1961 to 2021, I have actually picked up very significant cyclone hazards in the uh, Sundarban coastal tracts. And then we have also estimated the volumetric replacements of the sediments from the beaches, from the sand dunes, and uh, from the bars uh, to the offshore area and to the other parts of the uh, uh, other parts of the coastal area, particularly the inner parts of the estuaries. There you can see that how the sand dunes, the volume of the sand dunes have been reduced and the beach sands though have been increased, but actually sandbars have been increased rapidly in the form of the speeds and the bars in the Sundarban coastal area and also in the other parts of the Odisha coast. Here you can see that 6 lakhs 75,807.12 cubic meters of the sediments actually uh, transferred from the beaches, dunes and from the bars after 2009 Isla cyclone. And then we have also estimated following the bound rule method that uh, for a particular section I have uh, shown that since 2008 to 2021 total shifting of the soil land 131.7 meter landward shift will take place and uh, I have overlaid or superimposed the two successive beach profiles uh, which have been taken in 2008 and then in 2021 from that profile sections we are getting the different types of the volumetric shift of the sediments and also the landward shifting of the shoreline in the different sections of the coastal belts. And then we have also measured the, the tidal prisms. This is the predicted tidal prisms after one meter rise in the sea level which will take place in the Sundarban area. And there we have seen that how the Ichamuti Ranga, uh, Raimangal estuary and Matla estuary and Hugli estuary will be affected severely if one meter rise of the sea level takes place. And then if we compare between the existing channel width and it is also predicted after a one meter rise in the sea level. There also we can see that how the Hugli estuary, Matla estuary and Ichamuti estuary will suffer maximum because of the rise of the sea level and because of the increasing width and the overtopping effects and the inundation problems, salt water inundation problems will take place in the near future in the low lying tracks of the Sundarban area. Then the overwash, overwash sediment input or the external supply of the sandy sediments from the sea beaches and from the sand dunes into the inner part of the coastal wetlands dominated by the mangrove forest. We have estimated in different sections of the coastal region in Odisha and West Bengal in the uh, uh, in, in volumetric uh, uh, sediments, volumetric sediments from one place to the other place uh, by this, which is occurring in different parts of our mangrove dominated coast here you can see that the entire mangrove forest, the mature mangrove forest was totally filled up by the uh, sediments transported from the external sources, particularly during the uh, events of the cyclones, the high 
frequency and high intensive and high magnitude cyclones which are occurring at present in this area. A few publications since 2014 to 2023, we are working on this type of the modern approaches of the coastal geomorphology and environment using the machine learning tools. And so this is the most vibrant ecosystem. This photograph is taken in the month of July from the Hamilton Island near Raibhanga estuary. Uh, so you can see that still this type of the vibrant ecosystem actually are not present in the western part of our Indian Sundarban. So we have to monitor, we have to restore our similar type of the habitats in the near future just to reduce the impacts of the hazards and the ocean dynamics that will occur in the near future in our uh, country. Thank you everybody. Thank you, Professor Pal. I think now... Okay, and now I invite Professor Jana to make his presentation on man environment development in the 21st century. Respected chairpersons and uh, other plenary speakers, I am very grateful to the organizers for giving me this opportunity for this plenary session. Actually, we are in a situation where there is an urge for economic development and compulsion for environmental protection. That is the anxiety of the environmental experts and the concerns for the UN organization. Next. Oh, sorry. So look at the world population growth. In first year, it was 200 million. Now there is a prediction that by 2083, the population will reach by 10 billion. Next. Oh. So this snapshot shows the countries by population density. That is, if you look, that Asian countries are the largest contributor to world population. Even now India ranks first in terms of population number. China has drastically changed the population growth. Now China is second, India is first. And the latest figure is we have already crossed 140 crore population. Very interesting figure. The big red, red patch of Asian countries, I mean, India, Pakistan, China, Japan, and Bangladesh. Even among the Asian countries, South Asian countries are the largest contributor to world population. This shows the population by continental region. Among the world population, Asian countries contributes the most. And by 2050, it will uh, reach to the largest amount. I mean, Asian countries are the uh, countries which are uh, giving the concerns and anxiety to the world experts. This is projected populations of the 10 largest countries. You see that uh, 
China was the first. Now China is second. India is first. At least India ranks first in terms of population number. So this snapshot gives you, I mean, it's a photograph, but this shows the future of the world. This is, this puts the million dollars for the survival of human population. Trend and forecast of the world population. By 2025, it will reach to 82.9 billion. And definitely, Asian countries shares the most. So, this is very interesting emoji. World population by 2050. I mean, this sumo gives you very interesting concern for the environmental experts. Now question is whether Mother Earth is overburdened? Yes, it is overburdened by the number of population. If you look at the emoji that overpopulation as compared to resource base. I mean, we know the the concept of optimum resource. But when there is overpopulation, resource base, uh, there is, there is a, will be a crisis of the resource base as compared to the overpopulation. And that is the threat of our civilization. So what is happening? It's a big concern for the terrestrial biomes, the ecological systems of civilization. So population is at the core. I have already mentioned the line that there is an urge for economic development and compulsion for environmental protection. That means we are in a situation of vicious circle of development. We are in the chakra buho. We have to ca carry out the development, but we have to keep in mind the environmental panorama so that because there is a million dollars question of survival of the present and future generations to come. So this is because this is a new trend. I mean, in developing country, particularly in India, small and medium towns are coming up. There is an increasing tendency of urbanization. And we are now very much concerned about the rural-urban continuum or rural-urban linkage. This is also complex interplay of human development, not merely because we were very much concerned about the anthropocentric approach in development. So many things are associated with human development. There is gender perspective, there is women perspective, there is life, there is humanity, equality, social exclusion, inclusive development, so many things which is very much associated with human development. And if you look at this figure, that three triangles are there, society, economic, environment. And the complex interplay, we are now thinking about the social justice, whether all the development benefits are being acc accrued by the all sections of people in the society, because there is a question of social justice. We are now very much concerned about the sustainable development. We are very much concerned about public health, population size, and there is politics and rule of law. There is politics of development. So population is a national problem. To my opinion, population it's an international problem, not the national problem. Because each and every country, they have their perspective of population growth, and accordingly, the 
development strategies are being formulated keeping in view the population number their demands desires and aspiration but it is a international problem world population day keeping in view the number of population in 1989 population i mean 11 I mean, in every year, 11th July is celebrated as the World Population Day. Keeping in view the concern about the increase, increasing population number. So this emoji is very significant. This is World Population Day, and man is riding with his wife and a number of kids, you know. This is very symbolic. So this is the situation. It, I mean, it gives you the concern for the increasing number of population. So, there is initiative from the UN organization, Millennium Development Goals are there. I am not uh, going through the detail of Millennium Development, but one goal is there, goal seven, ensure environmental sustainability. This goal is very important because this goal is to be ensured, keeping in view the increasing number of increasing environmental degradation. Sustainable development goals are there. Now, we are at the crossroad of hazards and disaster and the Sendai framework for action, which uh, exhibits the Population, I mean environmental, I mean uh, balanced environmental development keeping in view or uh, the increasing hazards and disasters. Because sustainable development goal by 2030, it is to be achieved by reducing the disaster risk all over the world. So the approach has been changed. So little bit about the psycho setup of human being, transformation of human psychology. Because the population, I mean the human population is the main culprit for the increasing environmental, de increasing environmental degradation. Because man was, I mean if we go through the historic progression of human civilization, we will find primitive man, social man, economic man, technological man, so the transformation of the capacity of human being which are responsible for increasing environmental degradation. Because the cordial relationship with the environment, now it has been changed to, I mean the need has been switched over to greed. The, there has been a switching over from demands to desires and then desires to aspirations. So the aspirations, I mean, there is no harm to be aspirant, but there is a harm to be greedy. So men in different capacities, which are responsible, I mean, technological men. Now, I used to say the automatic man. I mean, now we are going through the period of automation. There has been shift in ideology. Sub subjective viewpoint to objective viewpoint. The subjective viewpoint reflects the world of mind, objective viewpoint reflects the world of actuality. So now we have switched over to subjective approach to objective approach, which is also responsible for degradation of environmental panorama. Because our ideology has been changed, our approach has been changed. So this is nothing but, the, the, I mean, this is our requirement the safe and just space for humanity. So this is our requirement in the 21st century. We have already uh, going to complete the first quarter of 21st century. The requirement is safe and just space for humanity because uh, we are at the crossroad of risks. That risk is to be reduced and that is the focal point of achieving sustainable development goal. So help before cracks up. I mean, the cracker during uh, 
Diwali. If we do not restrain our greedy paws, then it will burst. So that is the concern, that is the anxiety for the human population and the international export. So now we have to shift from the anthropocentric approach to omnicentrism because we have to restore the biodiversity. We should not be confined with anthrop anthropocentric. We have given much more emphasis on anthropocentric development. We have to give, now we have to shift our emphasis to omnicentrism. We have to restore our biodiversity. Otherwise, there will be million dollars question mark on the existence of our present generation and future generations to come. Th thank you, sir. So thank you, Professor Jana. You, now we have the last uh, presentation uh, by Professor Roy. And he will speak on and uh, yeah, I think some modeling, mapping in the context of uh, flood hazards. Thank you. Number five. Okay. Very good afternoon. Respected chairperson, respected dignitaries, and the dear delegates. I am really grateful to the organizers of Brahmapur Hat College Department of Geography for inviting me and giving me a chance to deliver a lecture in this international seminar. And the focal theme of the seminar is an advancement in geographical studies, a multidimensional outlook. On this recent advancement in geographical studies, multidimensional outlook, I have selected a topic to share some of my knowledge that is risk assessment of flood susceptibility mapping and hydrological modeling by integration machine learning and GIS for enhanced predictions and decision makings. As you all of you know that geography as a subject it is really a diversified from its inception to the present day, geography has been changing very fast in its content, in its nature, in its research, as well as application. So, from theoretical knowledge to application-based aspect, as we are actually concerning about today's focal theme on recent advancement in geographical studies. So, the ad how we can actually go for flood susceptibility mapping and hydrological modeling by a new technique, which is of course one of the examples of recent advancement in the field of geographical learning. So in this, actually, in this paper I have actually tried to give the overview of the presentation. That is my presentation will be mainly confined with this the understanding of flood sustainability and its significance, the role of geographic information systems in flood sustainability mapping and hydrological modeling, application of machine learning in flood sustainability mapping and hydrological modeling, 
integration of machine learning and GIS, hydrological modeling for enhanced predictions, real world applications and benefits, case study on Kaljani River Basin. Next. It is not go. Okay. So, the understanding flood susceptibility mapping and its significance. Basically, as you know, there are various kinds of natural hazards as well as the cultural hazards. So, floods are among the most devastating natural disasters causing immense damage, which actually cause a large scale damage to the communities, infrastructure, as well as our common environment. And in this way, when we are actually considering flood one of the most important, as well as the havoc natural disaster, so flood sustainability mapping plays a very important role, crucial role, in predicting areas prone to flooding, enabling better preparedness and effective decision making. My second point, the role of geographic information system, GIS, in flood susceptibility mapping and hydrological modeling. GIS technology basically, as you know, of course, that it, the, this is the tool allows to capture, store and analyze and visualize the geographic data, offering a powerful tool for understanding the spatial aspects of flood susceptibility. By integrating the various data layers such as elevation, land use, soil types, river networks, we can create comprehensive flood hazard maps. Third one, the application of machine learning in FMS and hydrological modeling, that is machine learning, which is basically a subset of artificial intelligence AI, equips computers to learn from data patterns and make predictions or decisions without explicit programming and in sustainability mapping of flood machine learning algorithms can uncover intricate relationships between the various factors, which the factors that will be selected and to contribute flooding, producing more accurate and detailed susceptibility maps. Integration of machine learning and GIS, the synergy between machine learning and GIS where the magic actually, magical uh, actions actually take place. Machine learning algorithms can analyze best data sets extracted from GIS, identifying non-linear patterns as well as the interaction that might be overlooked through traditional methods and the integration enhances the accuracy and quality of flat susceptibility maps. And another point I will try to cover hydrological modeling for enhanced predictions, that is hydrological models which actually simulate the movement of water through various components of the hydrological system and by incorporating susceptibility maps derived from the machine learning all algorithms and the hydrological models, we can simulate and predict how different areas will be impacted by flood flooding under varying conditions and varying situations. And this will help in emergency planning, resource allocation, and to reduce the risk, uh, risk hazard. And finally, I will try to apply these machine learning algorithms and hydrological model for real world applications. And here, government, governments, urban planners, policy makers, disaster management, various disaster management agencies, be it the NGOs or the governments, use these integrated approaches to develop different efficient flood mitigation strategies. And early warning systems, evacuation plans, and infra infrastructural improvements 
are tailored based on the information derived from these advanced techniques. So, finally, in conclusion, the integration of machine learning GI and GIS in flood mapping and hydrodynamic modeling marks a significant leap forward in our ability to predict and mitigate the impacts of uh, flooding. So, before starting this, what are the traditional methods that are available that we generally use for flood sustainability mapping? That is the topographic analysis, land use land cover analysis, soil characteristic analysis, rainfall data analysis, flood records and historical analysis, geomorphological analysis, remote sensing and GIS. This is also one. This has now become the traditional, of course, and statistical tools and techniques, methods, and expert knowledge too. These are the traditional sustainability, flood sustainability mapping. And what are the modern methods for machine learning and uh, 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 artificial intelligence techniques, remote sensing and high resolution data, LIDAR based terrain analysis, hydrologic and hydrodynamic models, probabilistic approaches, ensemble models, multi -cria. So these are all, but I will not do all these things. Uh, my point of discussion will be confined only machine learning and AI, AI techniques. Here, so flood risk assessment of Kaljani River Basin using machine learning algorithms. So the main objectives of the a study to find out the appropriate flood influencing factors in the Kaljani River Basin to prepare an accurate flood sustainability map of the Kaljani River Basin by integrating machine learning techniques to prepare an accurate flood vulnerability map of the Kaljani River Basin by integrating machine learning techniques to prepare an accurate flood risk map of the Kaljani River Basin by integrating machine learning techniques and finally to identify the best fish model for the risks, flood risks in the study area. So this is the study of international river. So upper part which is actually shown in blue color, this is actually part of the, of the Tosha River. It originated in Bhutan and flows from north to south at the foothills of the Himalayas to meet the Brahmaputra River. And there are various major tributaries of this river. The study area, uh, sorry, it will be uh, 11,137 square kilometer and the length of the river is 230, approximately 239 kilometer. So data sources, I have collected and used different types of data. LOS, Pulsar DM, 12 meter resolution uh, for preparing elevation slope aspect. Open the table. So what are the influencing factors I have actually considered here? That is slope, uh, aspect drainage density, distance to road, topographic, rugged net index, stream power index, drainage from uh, distance from river, topographic, rugged net index, all these things. And for flood inventory, so the various layers I have actually, that is actually the meteorological follow that I have been prepared, used to prepare this uh, paper. So artificial network, that is AN, flood substitute mapping often involves, that is with the help of this, I have used, that is AN, artificial neural networks, support vector machine, then random forest approach, bagging approach, Gaishan process. Then this is actually the history of the flood in the Kaljani River Basin from 1991 to 2019 onwards. And the parameters for flood sustainability mapping, so elevation, slope, aspect, curvature. So the various map that has been actually have been prepared based on this. Uh, parameters used uh, by ANN. Drainage density, NDVI, linear mesh density, topographic ruggedness index.
So results, in this work, the flood susceptibility maps were previously using 21 influential factors by NN, SBM, RF random forest, bagging and Geyser model, and these are divided into five classes as very high, high, moderate, low, and very low flood susceptibility zones. Uh, figure 9 actually, this has been, there are five. So based on this, five uh, classes have been identified and depicted the final flood subsidy maps with the data through selected models of the river Kaljani Basin. The result of the flood subsidy maps generated through AN model that very low to very high risk, uh, that is 52, 50, more than 50 percent very low low more more than nine percent near about six percent medium highs near about six point five percent and very high near about twenty six percent area comes under the flat subsidiary mapping under the area study so in this support vector machine model 22 so different maps have been used by using different models so here i have shown the different areas area of flood susceptibility zones so after this the flood vulnerability parameters using the different vulnerability parameter meters we have also prepared the flood vulnerability mapping. So the parameters use distance from the flood shelter, distance from hospital, distance from road, and considering road, there is road density, population density, total number of population, total number of child population, number of female populations. So before the maps have been generated, so result actually shows in this work the flood vulnerability maps were prepared using 12 influencing factors by artificial neural network, SBM, random forest, bagging and Geyser model. And these are also classified into five classes, very high, high, moderate, low and very low flood vulnerability zones. And figure 10 that has been actually shown that these five classes, I am showing it table how much area showing as based on ANN that is 23.68 percent area under very low uh, vulnerability 26.6 percent under low moderate 13.45 near above 9 that is 8.79 high and very high 27.4 and but based on SBM model it is so there are some to some extent variation but if we see all the five models after using random forest that is here we have seen the different areas and after preparation of flood subsidiary mapping and vulnerability mapping finally we have actually created the flood risk zones that is Flood risk zone is the last stage where the flood risk will be higher, low or moderate. So considering if we see here again these five models have been used and the very different percentages have been actually identified very low, low under different models. And finally we see validation of the model. So for sustainability mapping out of these five models which model fit best fit and for flood vulnerability out of these five model which one is the best fit so in both the cases for flood susceptibility mapping and the flood vulnerability mapping out of these five that is an sbm rf and bagging as well as gaisha uh, gaishian model only it shows that rf which is near about uh, 0.99 that is it is showing as one uh, so this is more consistent and it is the best fit model in this case for the mapping of the flood susceptibility as well as the vulnerability of the area under study of Kaljani River Basin. So different 
photographs that have been actually taken during the flares and and we can also use the Arkswad model that is soil test soil and water test tool for uh, which is also used for water shed modeling software developed by the US Department of Agriculture and it is commonly used for scientific research environmental impact assessment water resource planning and it is also a powerful tool and using this SWAT model, Arc SWAT model, we can also go for hydrological modeling here that is the potential evapotranspiration, then evap uh, evaporation and transpiration, all these things have been calculated well, because of shortage of time, I am not in a position to go in detail. So sediment loss from the landscape, but also all this uh, uh, SWAT model have been applied in my study area that is the river Kaljani Basin. So this is actually the finally the in stream process the how deposition and erosion is taking place within the study area and landscape nutrition uh, losses that is loss of nitrogen, uh, nitrate surface runoff, how much it is taking place and nitrogen cycle this one is also we can generate and phosphorus cycle over plant growth what kind of plant will be uh, more uh, um, uh, healthy for growth in this uh, area points of source of water the different pollutants that also can be studied with this um, machine learning uh, technique as well as the using the SWAT model and also you can uh, see the uh, how much area that is the emergency flood control that is water supply recreation sediment storage so all these things we can do so this is actually the discharge from 1990 to 2020 onwards so if you see that is 19 uh, 2000 that is had the discharge is uh, high Again in the year 2010 as there is a high, so even in the year 2021 as because there is a high discharge, so in this year there, uh, there was a high flood in the area under study. So discharge has been measured in cubic per meter, uh, sorry per second and so sediment concentration, this also can be done water loss, sediment transportation, so thank you. So this is actually, simply we can say that the advancement which are being taken place, these are for the benefit of our society and geographers are, are always ready to accept this type of uh, techniques and technology based study so that we can go ahead for our future planning as well as for management of our various types of resources and to reduce our disaster as well as the hazards. Thank you for your patience hearing. So, <clears throat> thank you very much uh, for uh, your attention and I think we have more or less completed this plenary session and I don't think uh, the people have left or uh, went for tea but uh, I will give a few uh, say points uh, the way I have observed the first presentation by Professor De, he made a <coughs> review and presented uh, the evolution of uh, geomorphology uh, from the classical time to the present time and with the new branches that are coming up and uh, scholars are working in different lines. And Professor Bandopadhyay, of course, raised one important issue and concluded like a landform and uh, say water level, land level and water level, both of them are rising uh, in Sundarban areas and particularly one important aspect that uh, many of the areas already reclaimed. 
and uh, so my concern is he is not here. Uh, so that reclaiming land is it good uh, from environmental point of view or any other measures to be taken? How we can restore back uh, the environmental concerns in Sundarban? And of course, <coughs> it is based on his research work. And there are many say concerns, and he is not here. We simply cannot say clarify from him. And uh, then the next presentation by uh, Professor Paul and very looks interesting. And uh, he uh, made some theoretical and policy perspective from coastal studies point of view in the context of uh, say climate induced coastal hazards, coastal vulnerability, and uh, uh, say sustainable issues. But it would be much better if he can adopt some Indian case studies to justify what he has presented in theoretical form. And Professor Jana's presentation, mostly philosophical and uh, based on secondary global data, and uh, he raised uh, the concern for the future and to what extent our MDGs and SDGs will address those concerns to make our uh, say world livable. And uh, the last presentation by Professor Roy uh, looks uh, quite interesting, but to me uh, very complex. And he has tried to address many different uh, issues from a methodological point of view. And uh, to what extent uh, all those methodology really uh, can be used by geographers and uh, say uh, availability of uh, uh, the, say, technology and uh, then application, right application and uh, deriving those analytical results, uh, how we can uh, make the best use of it in the context of, uh, say, um, uh, potential uh, flood-prone areas. Looks interesting but very complex and methodologically it is complex and I think uh, I checked uh, it is his own uh, research work, not any funded research work, but he's trying to uh, complete it, but not yet complete, and hopefully he will make a good say, publication out of it for the benefit of uh, geographers. And uh, I think I'll request Professor Roy to make uh, and present it in a simpler tone so that, uh, uh, say, general leaders can follow it up. And if it is very complex from methodological point of view, there are several questions. And uh, say you also mentioned about uh, hydrological modeling. Basically, water resource engineers, they have very quantitative models and, and to a high extent that we as geographers can do. And so therefore, maybe there is a need to collaborate with those kind of people, those who are uh, much better off in terms of uh, technical knowledge and quantification and then probably we can support them with a GIS and other kind of technology. So by fusing uh, these two sets of methodology, probably it will be more useful. But those things should be very much streamlined and until and unless it is really published uh, in a peer-reviewed journal, then uh, there are several questions. It will be in our mind. So thank you for your presentations and uh, your support and cooperation. With this, uh, we conclude this plenary session. So thank you very much to all of you. Thank you.
uh, today in our uh, group and maybe one or two may be missing actually but uh, we'll just call whoever is available here and uh, once they come on to this stage we'll start our program so professor ashish paul is he there yes sir please come please come. Professor Sunil Kumar Reddy. Yes, sir, please. Professor Ranjan Roy. Professor Subhish Sarkar's coordinator. Yeah, so, that I'll tell last. Okay. Professor Mujibur Rahman. Professor Ashish Shakur. Professor Narayan Chandra Jana. Yes, sir. Professor Devendra Kumar Nai. Yes, sir. Professor Ellen Satpati. Yes, sir. Yes. Professor Azizul Rahman Siddiqui. I think uh, our panel uh, members have come, and the panel discussion will be coordinated by. Professor Subhi Shankar. Please, sir. So, the panel discussion will be recent advances in geography. So, that is the topic and uh, the stage is set. Let us listen to them and uh, see what actually we can do better in the future with their advisors. ultimate stage of the first day of international seminar on recent advancement in geographical studies, a multidimensional outlook. So, 
So our panels are composed of seven members, and since we are we have very short time, uh, I would request all panel members to complete their program within uh, uh, their topic within four to five minutes. So I can start. Uh, oh, uh, one more important point is that although originally there was a plan for two separate panels, uh, one for physical Controversial it may be that it's a false dichotomy that we keep on talking about because geography lacks a theory. And this has been the major issue uh, since 19th and 20th century when this false dichotomy has been raised and continues to guide generations of geography students and scholars by separating geography into two different domains. So the first thing that I would like to say is that it's a false dichotomy. And this continues because the more the, the, more the things change. was a long debate in India by, started by Professor A.B. Mukherjee um, who talked about what ails geography. He didn't say physical or human. And, and talked about in India how geography has remained as an ailing subject, um, primarily because it, is, it did, could not Indianize itself and remained under the colonial influence for so long that um, Indianization has been a major issue and he was pleading for it, which was formally reported by Professor Ezauddin Ahmad in his um, lecture in uh, 1996, if I'm, if I'm not correct, if I'm not wrong, uh, at Thirubhinantapuram uh, Indian Geography Congress, who strongly reported this statement of Indianization. He said, what does it mean? Um, can knowledge be bounded by a country's geographical boundaries? Knowledge remains knowledge, and it's by definition, um, it's boundary free. It's universal. So to say, to, to, to convert knowledge into Indian knowledge and American knowledge is, is something that actually dwarfs geographical knowledge. Then there were a series of papers written by, uh, uh, initiated by Anu Kapoor, who wrote a paper on languishing geography in economic and political weekly. There she talked about the demise of human geography or neglect of human geography. And she was joined by many others in saying that uh, there has been a colonial domination of physical geography and uh, human geography is languishing. And there were many others. 
but all these can be seen in terms of what i would like to posit before you that there was an old, there's been a lack of social theory and we have been continuing with a predominance of environmental theory it has nothing to do with human and physical but where the explanation should come from and how one should view geography so uh, I, I do not mean to say that by environmental theory i mean human geography geography should be a physical geography or um, uh, geography should be a human geography. Social theory would always ask questions which have social origin and it explains any aspect of geography. Now, I don't want to take much more time. I would just quickly uh, uh, trace what has happened since 1980s. Until 80s, we know that uh, in 70s particularly, there was a growth of uh, social uh, geography as a social sciences, but hadn't developed much bigger roots. And by 80, there were significant changes that took place into the domain of geography. And I would quickly um, make uh, those points clear to this August audience. There were basically many societal changes that took place in this period uh, since 1980s. And that affected the course of geographical practice. I don't say geography per se, but geographical practice. And there were shifts, quick shifts in the topics which responded to this changing reality. Most significant of this change was the uh, deepening economic crisis and uh, the globalization which took place almost everywhere in the world, including that of India. So the, this, this change in the social reality brought a um, lot of changes to the economic sphere, then global changes at the interface of the physical and human phenomena. That was the first kind of change one should um, note as a major shift in which resulted in topical shift in geography uh, that uh, can be seen as social theory becoming uh, predominant. Secondly, there was a disappearance of the communist re regimes in the political spheres in this point of time, and uh, there was a growth of Post-modernist approach Naik, that led to. May I request you yeah. to conclude? Yeah, I'm just concluding. I'm just concluding. Thank you. Led to cultural changes in cultural sphere. These three tectonic changes post um, 1980 have influenced human geography to address topics which were hitherto unknown or unaddressed to geography. These changes have made much of the traditional issues topics in uh, uh, appearing as desperately obsolete. So obsolence took place. For example, the celebrated uh, factorial ecology approach in urban geography is replaced by studies on globalization and polarization. In economic geography, distance and um, transportation costs are being um, or have, be, have given way to flexibility network or learning regions. Postmodern influences have emphasized on social exclu exclusion studies. These have been the most important changes that took place because of topical shifts. The other factors have been, one is um, the, the, so the debates that took place within the, sub, uh, within the discipline, and the third one is the changes in the technology, particularly GIS. All of these have changed the course of human geography. I don't want to uh, discuss more. If there are questions, I will certainly um, be happy to answer them and elaborate them. Thank you. Thank you, <coughs> Professor Naik, uh, for your valuable presentation. Now I would request Professor Lokhi Shantshatputi, Lokhi Dharan Shantshatputi, for his. Please, sir, the time is very limited. Yes, yes. Five minutes maximum. Thank you, Honorable Chair. Professor Nayak has rightly pointed out the misleading conception of this binary between physical and human geography. And geography should be treated as a whole without the understanding of the other. Somewhere we really going to miss the right kind of interpretation. And particularly in these days, when the 
definition of space, the very basic element of geography, had changed with the incorporation of virtual space, then perhaps we have to understand and think beyond the traditional meaning of this binary. Secondly, so what we should do? We have incorporated the GIS. And very often, I was going through some of the presentations also. And we have found that without understanding the underlying factors, we are trying to explain something and trying to project also. Let me give an example from the share market, which is very interesting, Roman. And 90% of the people are the losers, only 10% the gainers. In the stock market, there are basically two things. One is the fundamental with the balance sheet and many other things. And another is the technicals, all the moving average and all that. But beyond that, there is a concept called news. News makes price. And here this news is very much manipulated. So when a society is manipulated, then how can we see what is not shown to us? So our learning is very often modeled learning. In that modeled learning, we, the geography and geographers are also suffering. And that's why whenever we are trying to incorporate some kind of models and trying to project something for the future, then somewhere we are doing not what should give the proper justification to the interpretation. So this is number one. Second is then what geographers' relevance of today and in that sense how geography can be made relevant. In the morning session, Dr. Nag was talking about Professor S.P. Chatterjee, the domain of Indian geography. Think about his time and how his time, the demand of the time, he tried to fulfill through various activities. And now, where the society, our society is situated, and our nation is trying to, the state is trying to lead us with the changed political economy, which is very much connected with the digital platforms. So we have to judiciously use our thought process. All subjects must have its political ideology, and geography should not be an exception. So unless we can identify our position as geographers, how we want to see, then our subjects will lament as before what our previous geographers lamented. And many sorts of binaries were created leading to nowhere. So ge geographers must think that how we can contribute for the different kinds of planning processes and mere land use, land cover classification and some projections about the future uh, land use and all that, it is not. We have to think something more. And with our political ideology, we have to design our learning process, the models and all that. So then only geography will survive. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Shatpoti. And now I would uh, like to request Professor Siddiqui yeah. to deliver his address. Thank you, Chair. Uh, today we have a topic of recent advancement in geography, particularly in recent advancement in human geography. Uh, we have, uh, in the morning session, uh, Professor uh, Nag already discussed about the a relevance of contribution of Indian scholars. So I, I, I just, uh, Professor Nayak already mentioned about the dominance of colonial uh, impact on geography. Uh, we are here to discuss about the philosophy of the subject and uh, subject matter as well as methodology. In the last 100 years, uh, particularly in the last 100, 100 years, 
particularly in the context uh, in the syllabus of India uh, in Indian con uh, Indian subcontinent as well as in the syllabus of uh, developing con uh, developed countries, uh, we have to assess uh, in the recent uh, time how syllabus of geography is going to be changed and what type of methodology are we are going to be adopt and uh, how uh, what is the philosophy of geography. Uh, geography, uh, as uh, uh, Professor Pete already mentioned, geography is what? What geographers do? So nowadays uh, it is uh, very uh, important to discuss about the philosophy of the subject, particularly in the country where the 40,000 PG colleges are here and 1,000 Indian universities. So there is the issue, what type of syllabus we are going to uh, teach, particularly what uh, topic we have added in our syllabus. Uh, you see, uh, and when we'll uh, uh, talk about the modernism and postmodernism, you have already mentioned about the uh, many geographers. I will quote here uh, about the Jean Francois Leotard. He mentioned about the modern science does not explain about the humanity. But human geography is based on to explain about the humanity. So how we can correlate with the advancement of the science uh, uh, with the humanity? Because uh, we are always concerned about uh, space, uh, first space, second space, and third space. So here the issue, uh, because uh, we have to explain uh, the regional variation uh, as uh, already uh, Richard Harshon uh, given definition in 1959, geography uh, orderly, accurately, and rational description of variable character of the uh, earth. But nowadays, with definition, we are going to follow for the human geography. So there are various issues and many uh, scholars already mentioned about the, uh, he has given, uh, as uh, Michael Foucault uh, believe in, uh, in difference, study of difference and fragmentation, discontinuity. So uh, here now, in the current time of human geography, we are discussing about the speciality of power, speciality of government policy. So I take an example of India. Uh, in Indian, uh, Indian uh, uh, geography, you see uh, there is a difference of uh, land form, there is a difference of environmental conditions. So as a geographer, we should uh, explain about the specific uh, phenomena uh, which is uh, different from area to area. So there is an issue of not philosophy because uh, we are always explaining geography in terms of time and space. But we, here we can see uh, time lost knowledge. Uh, we were uh, studying uh, geography in syllabus of lithosphere, atmosphere, hydrosphere. Uh, but now uh, I think there is a need to add one more sphere, knowledge sphere. Just Professor uh, Nayak already mentioned about the knowledge. So there is a difference in the knowledge. There is a difference in the geographical setup. So in every uh, every region, in every space, there is uh, some unique characteristics. So recent advancement, what type of model, what type of technology, what type of methodology you are get, going to adopt in, in, in a particular area. So there is a series of spatial cells. So there is a series of spatial cells. As a geographer, we have to know uh, about the unique character of uh, every cells, every space. Uh, then we can uh, we can become able to uh, define about the uh, content of the syllabus of geography uh, because uh, uh, Pete and uh, Foucault and Philo already already given emphasis about the explaining about the uh, details of differences and details of differences. But our daily life and our psychological behavior, our action, our thought. Our awakening is uh, modified by local area. So the task of geographer, the main objective of geographer uh, to uh, identify, to assess uh, characteristics of any particular area, any specific area. So uh, when we are talking about the methodology, subject matter and philosophy of geography, and uh, in the last 50 years, uh, in particularly India, uh, in India, uh, our uh, history of innovation is very sh short. Uh, our history of uh, innovation is very short. So we cannot uh, compare our achievements with the uh, uh, developed countries. And uh, because uh, take an example of uh, uh, application of remote sensing and GIS, which have been started from 1972. So, uh, so how we can uh, 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 we can adopt? 
uh, and uh, in the syllabus of geography you can see uh, one thunen theory which was uh, published in 1826 but this is the beauty of theory after 200 years of time we are studying one thunen theory in our syllabus and you see the beauty of theory of uh, alfred weber Uh, industrial location theory but after 115 uh, years uh, we are uh, we are studying about the weber theory likewise uh, kistaller central place theory which was published in 1933 uh, but still in 2023 we are having in our syllabus so now the question arises in the recent time what will be the methodology what will be the subject matter and what will the, the uh, philosophy of the geography in the our pg and ug syllabus because in indian uh, scenario and uh, there is a uh, lot of uh, deviations in the academic institution and we cannot compare whole india because 69% 68% population are residing in uh, village area and uh, uh, 31% population are residing in urban area so we have to uh, uh, make an intensive study regarding the framing of our syllabus in the current scenario of human geography because uh, uh, as a human geographer there are uh, uh, many things to explain how power differs how po policy differs it depends on area to area thank you sir for giving me time thank you very much thank you professor siddiqui for your presentation now i would like to request professor jana to deliver his presentation uh thank you chair after the introduction of quantitative revolution in geography geography physical geography human geography have taken a new shape and direction like physical geography human geography has evolved for long time that means the development of human geography is very old and with time there has been the emergence of sub disciplinary fields in human geography i mean initially cultural geography economic geography health geography historical geography political geography population geography now rural geography heritage geography heritage geography has now emerged a new branch in geography administrative geography and so on so with time in future there will be again rebranching of human geography i mean with time with demand the sub fields of sub disciplinary field of human geography will be specialized and as evolution of human geography is concerned society is concerned first there was traditional society then pre conditions to take up now we are talking about the cultural take up drives to maturity age of high mass consumption and uh, i mean the earlier panelist they have already pointed out we are now dealing with space location human environment interaction which i have deliberated in the plenary lecture movement and region i mean how mobile the man is and there are several dimensions of human geography social economic cultural political demographic of human existence the situational analysis in geographical space that means the geography with time has become cross disciplinary and it is gradually becoming complex keeping in view the attitude and behavior of human is concerned there are some popular terms in 21st century when i used to teach in the class cultural geography 
I used to mention give and take. These are the new concepts or new terms which are using give and take policy. Use and throw, profit maximization, greed and consumption, cost benefit, the, which, are, which are commonly, which are not commonly used, loosely, but these reflect the psycho setup of contemporary human society. And give and take. What is this give and take, use and throw? I mean, we use, uh, uh, I mean, dot pen, use and throw. But the, this has the greater implication in human society. So if we look at the recent trends in human geography, we are now giving much more emphasis on rural urban linkage. We are giving emphasis on social exclusion and inclusive development. We are now engaged in measuring the geography of opportunity. And there are a number of geopolitical problems which have been evolved with the passage of time all over the world. We are now dealing with issues of well-being. We are now dealing with livelihood issues. We are now engaged in dealing with preferably the issues of disasters all over the world at the global level, national level and the local level. And there is another area to focus on cooperation, competition, convergence between North and South because there is geopolitical conflict and contradiction all over the world. I mean all the subdisciplinary fields in human geography are exclusive but these are, these are mutually interdependent. Physical geography has exclusive nature, human geography has exclusive nature. But now we are trying to bridge the gap between physical geography and human geography. Now we are rethinking on interdisciplinary across the social sciences. And Government of India, Particularly, University Grants Commission is emphasizing on interdisciplinary study. And last but not the least, we have deviated from anthropocentrism to omnicentrism because, I mean, in 2021, 5th June, on the day of World Environment Day, UN has introduced one far-reaching program, UN Decade of Ecosystem Restoration. That means they are re-emphasizing on the restoration of major ecosystems of the world. That we have to restore the biodiversity. We should not give much more emphasis on the development of human being, but we have to give much more emphasis of omnicentrism. We have to restore the biodiversity. Otherwise, the civilization will be perished. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Jana, for, for your presentation. Now, I would like to request Professor Ashish Paul for your presentation, please. So, <coughs> after a prolonged technical session and the today's discussion, so at this moment, actually, <coughs> we need very precise and very refined studies at the local scale using the modern equipments and also the modern techniques, remote sensing and modeling uh, for the benefit of the society and particularly on the basis of the field-based information. We have to concentrate on the field-based information for the local scale studies for the benefit of the society. And number two, we need also hazard microzonations at the coastline and also along the river banks. At presently, we have no hazard microzonations in this area of the vulnerable tracts. Number three, we need the coastal information systems. We have the ocean information systems, we have the geographical information systems, but we have no coastal information systems. We have to develop them, particularly for the 
gathering of the data on tide, waves, bathymetry, sediments, and local weather conditions for modeling in the near future. And number four, understanding and predicting the climate-induced coastal hazards actually needed for the coastal managers for the better management practices in the coastal area. So number five, we can also advocate in the favor of the resilient coast. We have to think about the restoration of the habitats. We have to uh, think about the conservation of the lost habitats in the coastal area for the better future and the resiliencies of the coastal tracts where the livelihoods are also, uh, livelihood of the local people are associated with them. Then number six, we have no vision plan for the climate refugee, but Australia and USA, they have made the 25 years vision plan for the climate refugee. So these are the major uh, issues I want to raise at this moment for the benefit of the society, for the benefit of the subject, and for the advancement of the coastal studies and the physical geographical studies in the country. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Professor Pan, for your presentation. Now I would like to request Professor Sunil Kumar De to deliver his speech. <clears throat> Mr. Chairman, sir, my dear co-panelists and dear participant and luminaries sitting in front of me. Since I'm a geomorphologist, so I will not try to enter in any other domain rather than geomorphologist. As in the beginning session, I was going to say in the recent advancements that geomorphology is not a non-linear subject. It means that if any event takes place, any geomorphic change takes place behind that, there are a number of causes. So on the basis of this, I would rather follow the task of geomorphologists written by a lady, Professor Heather Wales from the University of Oxford, and which determines the recent advancement in geomorphology. Number one, landscape are shaped, are shaped by this movement of mass. It means that weathering and erosion are the preliminary process of any type of change. Number two, landscape shaping processes are influenced by many different factors, including human factors. We'll come in the next point. When any type of landscape is being changed, tectonic activity from tectonic activity to the geomorphological activities are responsible and there are many other factors responsible for this. Since the shortage of time, I am not explaining in details. Number three, landscape processes operate at different scales. If any landslide occurs, it's in a micro scale, a part of the hill slope is operated, affected. But if any major flood occurs, it may be the low whole downstream part of any river valley. This is mesoscale. So naturally, if any high magnitude earthquake occurs, then it takes a big region like Syria, Turkey, earthquake, you know, 60,000 people, more than 60,000 people died. So this type of changes occur at different scales. Number four, arts landscape are dynamic. This is a concept. This is, of course, correct because every time all landscape are being changed due to different regions. Number five, landscape dynamics are often complex. Sometimes, you know, we should not go, we, we have forgot the cyclic concept. We use some of the techniques which is, as a tool we use it, but if we really go to study the process geomorphology, they are complex. We need to lie in the field, we need to study the field in, in, in intensively. Landscape are archives of the past. With this genesis of these different types of dating techniques, we have understood that some of the landscape, those are paleo landscape, they were landscape, they were covered with different types of masses. Again, it is coming out, and we, are, we call them as beauty topography. So all processes have been operating throughout the geological time. Global change is influencing Landscape dynamics. <clears throat> Today we are feeling heat wave here, whole eastern India. 
in himalayan region in many places glaciers are melting this is due to global environmental change geomorphology is also changing so this is also a new concept in geomorphology human activities are influencing landscape dynamics you know if you ask this the corporate people that you are displacing this materials you are collecting this minerals from this place they will say that what wrong with is but you know this balance is being created and human activities due to human activities on an average we are displacing about 600 billion tons of sediment per year over the earth surface this displacement creates a havoc and and creating different types of hazardous activities number 9 the earth's landscape are becoming more hazardous and we are responsible behind this one natural processes take very less time to change the topography very slow slowly they change the topography but human activities within one year within two years they can change the whole topography so naturally this earth's landscape changing are becoming faster and lastly successful environmental management needs geomorphological knowledge you know i can recall samapad geomorphologist in different big committees including professor sarkar professor dc goshami he was central ia committee of the government of india and this geomorphological knowledge is very important for giving permission to any type of activities so this is our application nowadays so with this few words i once again thank all of you for carefully listening thank you thank you professor de uh, now we are at the last panelist professor ranjan rai will speak very good evening respected chairperson professor subir sarkar respected co panelist today we have gathered here to discuss about the recent advancement in geographical studies a multidimensional outlook so first of all what my co panelist members they have actually described to some extent i agree but also i am also differing from their point of views regarding what should be the future of geography in the 21st of century first of all my individual observation is from the authority of the organizing this seminar that they have divided these two panel one is human geography another is physical geography what i totally i want to scrap from my mind why i do not believe i personally i don't feel myself as a physical geographer neither a physical geographer nor a human geographer i am very much proud to feel myself as a geographer i am a geographer so if i i don't know about geography what is the utility of physical geography or what is the utility of human geography first of all we have to know about these two things so the debate which has been started long long back this is in the year of 20 in the present century 21st of century we are carrying on this should not be happened why it is only because when we actually study the geographical elements we study the various geographical elements in the light of physical aspects for what purpose to study our human beings so in this present context when there is many of the developments have already taken place from the theoretical knowledge base to the right now to the technological base for example in my plenary lectures i have actually discussed one topic the topic was 
the assessment of the blood susceptibility mapping and hydrological mapping for decision making. In that, in that assessment of blood susceptibility mapping, I have to consider physical aspects for what? For susceptibility mapping, I have considered 22 physical factors. For what purpose? To create the vulnerability mapping by integration of the various cultural or human factors. And this is for, for the assessment of the risk hazard mapping. This is also for the human beings. So without, without the knowing physical geography, human geography cannot be sustained and without knowing the aspects of the human geography, physical geography cannot be advanced. So I think with the geographers, with the academicians who are teaching in the higher level like college and university, we should stop this debate because Right now, we are actually focusing on integrated approach, interdisciplinary approach, multidisciplinary approach. There is no concept of a single line approach. So, I think the, with the Indian geographers, we should stop this debate, first of all. Otherwise, the debate will continue. One group will say, I am the geomorphologist and I am the urban geographer. Geography will be disturbed and there will be an identity crisis. And in many of the places, what already happened? So we should not continue this type of debate. To myself, to me, I feel, first of all, I am a geographer. I will learn physical assets. At the same time, this physical access, how it can be applied for the benefit of the society. Society means for the development of the human beings. Right? So, we should stop this debate. First of all. And second one, what is the utility of old model like Van Dunen's model, what Professor Siddiqui has told, uh, already mentioned about the crystalline model. Why we are not actually studying new new model? Why we are not creating? Why we are de only depending on the various types of models that are de derived from economics, that are derived from the other branches of social sciences? Why we are not actually individually learn or we are not in a position? So we are going debate. So. And to the authority, I will suggest that this type of panel discussion, I do not agree. Their panel discussion should be Hello. recent advancement in geographical studies, a multidirectional outlook, instead of giving human geography one, another is physical geography. Myself, actually I also work in human geography, even in physical geography. So I am not geomorphologist, I am not a human geographer, I am a geographer. That is my view. Thank uh, you all. Dear Professor, dear Professor. Professor, thank you for your presentation. Sir. Thank you. It was exciting. Yeah, yeah. Sir, now, may, may I? I, I would like to thank for all the panelists for their nice presentation, particularly at the end, Professor Roy raised a very important question. Of course, of course, uh, this question uh, is not a new one. Over the last hundred or more than hundred years, this question is there. And today, at the global scale, geography has disintegrated. Many part of the world, there is no geography. They already already disintegrated the different sub-disciplines. My huh. There is no geography in the most of the European countries. In 
Russia and also some portion of U.S. However, that, that is a different issue of debate. Today we don't have that much of time to go for that particular debate. But I would like to request our delegates, uh, if you have some comments on some query from the panelist, you are most welcome to have a specific query, please. Sir. 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 So from delegates, yeah. there is no query or opinion from the panelists. Okay. Now, Professor Siddiqui would like to say a few words. First of all, I would like to congratulate uh, Professor Ranjan Rai for uh, expressing his views regarding the human geography as well as physical geography. Uh, but he mentioned that I am not going to be agree or disagree. But uh, I want to correct, this is the syllabus of postmodernism, whether you agree or not agree. And geography, human geography has given canvas to, uh, to make your decision, you are going to agree or not agree. And this is the postmodernism. Individualism and uh, human geographer always give emphasis to individualism. What is the perception of an individual? And physical geography cannot solve the problem of society in the uh, like uh, if you are showing that I am very happy. So, how much you are happy? 5 kilograms you are happy or 10 kilograms you are happy? This is the not issue you are happy. I am more happy, I am less happy. Only human geography solve your problem and only human geography explain about the emotions, quality of life, uh, degree of uh, um, um, disturbance. And so how you can say that uh, the geography has no relevance and uh, of course uh, if uh, in, sci uh, in science uh, uh, you are doing researches, uh, if uh, your objective is not for the solving the problem of society, that is not science. So everyone, uh, whether it is physical geography or human geography are trying to solve all the problem of the, of the society and the one of the most important part in human geography that is cognitive and behavioral sciences and the role of geographer to um, to map the behavior and the role of geographer to uh, make a perception regarding individual um, uh, awakening regarding any particular space as already mentioned in my talk so I think both are important and without man there is no geography. Already we have defined the man is the center theme of geography. And this is a share that every man is in the center of the world. There is no issue to uh, read the faces of human beings. But in individual uh, there are multiple personalities and the, only geographer can assess uh, what type of personality uh, human beings are and the only geographer can assess what type of personality Dr. Our another he had having so only this is the role of geographer to to know the in depth of uh, your uh, knowledge. I have already mentioned about there is need to one more sphere, sphere hydrosphere, lithosphere, atmosphere. There is a need to uh, uh, add knowledge sphere in geography. Okay, thank, thank you, you, Professor Siddiqui. Now, Professor Shatpati, please. Uh, I have missed one thing. That is the importance of time in geography and this is very much neglected area because you know time can be a location, time can be a space. On the basis of the time window that we have to judiciously select because you know in terms of suppose global warming, if we take a decade sometimes it may decrease and if you take some other time frame then it will increase. So if we have to take appropriate decision, then the synchronization, convergence of time space is very, very important. And time is mostly underestimated area in geography. So we have to give value. Uh, 
I would like to uh, mention a few points only. Now, look, the geographers, what they are doing, what is their role in society? We are doing research work, collecting huge amount of data, producing volume after volume, thesis, book, articles. But for what purpose? For what? Who are the reader? Who are the taker? Is there anybody to take this? No demand for geographer. Geography in the last 50 years stands, I'm talking about Indian ge geography, last 50 years stand in the same place. Unless otherwise these geographers do something to go for a professional attitude, to serve the society, to serve the people, geography will remain like a cozy science what it was 100 years back till now. We are very cozy. Whenever we need, we are borrowing from Kressler. Kressler becomes geographer. Even, you know, that great man, Copen, he becomes geographer. All are imported as per our own requirement. We must find out some area where geographer can really do something. I can give just one example like urban sewerage problem. Urban drainage just sewerage one, problem. One point I, I will reply. Uh, a, a dentist specialist cannot do a surgery of your stomach. <laughs> no, no, no. This is right. Uh, a ENT specialist cannot do treatment to your heart. So you can promote your subject if you are a specialist. Without specialist, there is no improvement is going to take place, especially among us. Thank you. Okay, anybody else? Thank you, Professor De. But I have not mentioned there is no need of dentist, no need of cardiologist, no need of neurologist. I told that debate should be stopped between physical geography and human geography. You study geomorphology, no problem. But you should mention yourself as geographer. If you start I have not mentioned the no need of dentist, ENT specialist, cardiologist, neurologist, like that. I have mentioned the debate, what is going on, physical geography is greater than human geography or human geography is greater than physical geography. This should, debate should be stopped for further classification. All the aspects will be included in the domain of geography. Neither a physical geography nor a human geography. That is my point of discussion. So, perhaps this debate will never stop because geography bonds I'll just take one minute, sir. The debate is not whether or not human and physical geography. It has never been. The issue is not even which is better, which is necessary. The issue is that how geography has progressed over the years and what is the explanation in geography? Whether we look for an environmental explanation or we are moving towards social explanation or based on social theory. And the last 20 to 30 or 40 years has shown that geography is now veering towards understanding of a synthesis of be between the two, as is evident from studies like climate change, disaster or even um, such subjects which transcend the boundaries of physical or human. Specialisms would remain, there is no doubt about it, but the topics which are changing, which actually affect the human lives are emerging in a big way as a recent change and <coughs> social geography is firmly getting established as a social science which was not the case earlier.
this division was remaining because of this reason. Now that there is a congruence, there is a there is a con con there is a con um, conflating of the sorry the I don't get the word. There is a basically there is a confluence of the issues based on the real problems that are faced by the human beings. Geography is responding very adequately in these last few year, hundred, a few decades, and that's a good sign. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Knight. And now it's time for declaring closure because the next program will be delayed. So thank you. Thank you, everybody. <laughs> Chuk, 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 chuk. After the scintillating panel discussion, now is the time to move on to our cultural program. But to mark the transition, we have a little surprise for you. Our little friend, literally little friend, Priyanshi Dash, will now have a spirited performance, a dance, to lighten the serious academic atmosphere. Please welcome Priyanshi with a round of applause. Priyanshi.
আরেকটা নাচবে আরেকটু নাচবে আরেকটু নাচবে না She made us forget the entire day's fatigue, didn't she? What a beautiful child, what a beautiful performance. Let's move on to our cultural program now. A very good evening. We heartily welcome you to our Lal Matir Desh, the land of red earth of Bengal, Birbhum, where we feel and experience nature in its rudra roop, in its absolute vigor and passion. In the arid land of Red Earth, the monsoon arrives with a touch of vitality through the mellow shadow of rain clouds and the lush greenery of thriving vegetation. The heat-stricken inhabitants of the land greet the season with songs and dances.
Due to certain unavoidable circumstances, some of our performance performers are not here yet. We request the audience to kindly grant us a few minutes time and we will resume the program. We are extremely sorry for the delay. Please grant us a few minutes time. Our land of Red Earth imbibes all seasonal and cultural flavors of both folk and classical tradition with a spontaneous expression of life inherent in the collective imagination. Our student Yasri will now perform a medley.
Kamu
Monsoon is synonymous with life force and the sprouting of love. In the favorite season of Lord Krishna, who celebrated the season with Radha and her companions on a swing, the following string of classical and folk dances does celebrate life, love, and beauty associated with the spirit of monsoon while hailing Lord Krishna as its patron deity. Oh, 
entire universe, along with the cycle of seasons, revolves in a cosmic motion that is often interpreted by the poet as the cosmic dance of Shiva Nataraj. Now to conclude the evening in a spirited note and to give you a taste of the famous Baul Shongit of Birbhum, we have arranged for a Baul performance. Please welcome on stage our esteemed performers, Baul singer Sri Mahadev Dash, Sri Indrajit Chatterjee, Sri Hiru Dash, as accompanists in flute, we have Sri Roshamai Lit. In Tobla, we have Sri Deepak Dash. In Harmonium, we have Sri Moti Minoti Dash. In Percussion, we have Sri Moti Gita Dash. Please give them a warm round of applause and give us a bit of time so that we can arrange the Akra on the stage.
সকলে চরণে প্রণাম জানিয়ে বাবা দু একখান গান গাইব বাউলের পোশাক করেছি কিন্তু বাউল হতে পারেনি Yeah. 
হৃদয় সুস্থ রাখে উনি এক লোক সংস্কৃতি ভালো শ্রোতা ভালো গায়ক ভালো বাদক আমরা তাকে বলেছি আপনাদের কলেজের তাকে আমরা বলে ভিন্ন হয়েছি যে উনি আমাদের সাথে আছেন
तो सत्य मन मानस जो का ना थे शिल्पी हे श्रोता जो ना का ना पाए तो शिल्पी आवेगता थे ना तो भाई बोल से
আমাদের অনুষ্ঠান এখানেই শেষ করলাম আপনারা প্রান্ত গ্রাম সম্প্রদায় সাজ করবেন এইসব অনুষ্ঠান শুনতে পাবেন সকল বাসমস্য প্রফেসরদেরকে আমার শত কোটি প্রণাম জানিয়ে আজ প্রান্তিক বাউল সম্প্রদায়ের অনুষ্ঠান এখানেই সমাপ্ত ঘোষণা করলাম